things we noticed at some point in time, the microphones were not coming. And then we noticed that um, some people pulled their cables and used it on their laptops. Um, the network cables are for the microphones. And so don't, uh, if, if you need any connection, use the Wi-Fi and, and, and allow the microphones to stay as they are. If you, are, you want to talk and you are called to speak, you just press it and then you will be able to speak. So that's, that is that. So let's just do a quick try. Just wherever you are, you try it, and then after speaking, you put it on. It's, it's like Zoom. OK, that's fine. Once, once you are done, you can put it off. That, that's the first hello, one. Hello, hello, hello. OK, that's fine. Yeah. So hello. then the second thing is that at any point in time, if, if, if the hello. session is going on and you need to step out, you need to use the bathrooms. You use the back doors and use the side entrances so that you can go around the building and use the washroom. So that is that if you want to use the washroom, you, use, you exit through the back and then you go around the building and use the washroom. That, that is also that. And then the other thing that we want to also draw your attention to is that um, for those who have registered and, and, and the fully paid members of, of this conference, you would obtain a certificate after the program. Of course, this is a digital conference, so you have a digital certificate, and then you can print it out for use. Those who joined us online, I, I'll keep informing you about this. Those who joined online, we know that you are not here in person and you would also have been with us. So if we check and you join for two days, and we can verify that you join for two days, you are also due for certificate. However, you have to pay a small token, just uh, somebody who say fac facilitating fee, so that of, of 100 CDs to the account that the investee account, and then you will generate your certificate for you. I think it's fair that those of us who will be joining online and those who have been here and need certificate, some people were allowed to come in um, are, are graduate students. At least um, you need to be, do something small to show that you value the certificate that is being given to you. Even though the vice chancellor has graciously asked us to let all the postgraduates come for free and do all those things, when you need certificates, you must show some level of commitment and then and, and, and you pay and we'll process it for you. So that is that. Today's program would, 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 would be of a difference. In, we'll be having our keynote speaker uh, given to us. And then the last session, please, during the last session, we just want to inform you that we will have a good discussion. Yesterday, um, I, was, I was talking to some of the panel members for the last session. We'll be discussing more about the AI and its impact on um, the in higher education. And so it will be a nice session. So we will share some flyers and things around during that time. Share it with your faculty wherever they are in, in the world and let them also hear what other people think. Do who hear the good side, the bad side, all the things that are involved. And I'm sure my, my moderator, you will love him. He, he has a passion. And when you see him talk, you, 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 you will love him. So that is in, in the afternoon. Yesterday, by God's grace, we were able to have about eight, eight, 800, at some point, we were 820 views on YouTube at the same time, which, 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 was, which is a good sign. I mean that we are sharing work. So like the way they do it in churches, share the link, share the link, share the link. So we want you to always also share the link, share the link. You don't have to keep it alone, you must share. That is the essence of it because if you are 1% who knows all these things, it will be difficult for the change you are looking for. So share and let others also benefit from it. So before the opening prayer, whilst the others settle in, there's a small exercise that you, you will do, and then we'll bring, this is, all this is not part of today's session. It's just so that we will we'll get them. And then 
of course, you see water in front of you. So there's going to be a quiz on, on, on just three questions. We want to see who will be first. But before that, for fairness sake, please put the Wi-Fi on. If you don't have data, you just connect to the... You need to be online so that at least everybody will be... It will be fair, a fair assessment of it. Then you can see some water. Can I get one? Bell Aqua has graciously given us water for the whole period. In fact, as we drink, they keep bringing it to us. And I'm sure today we'll hear more of them, but it is just fair that we, we, we tell them of it. And one of the, please, let's clap for them. <laughs> See, the good thing is that the students we are teaching and bringing, he was our student, he has used our online platform, and he has... He's done his MPhil, their manager. And so when it's e-learning conference, because he has used it, it was easy to get sponsorship from, 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 from them. So that's one of the offshoots that happens with these things. So please, um, control room, can you put the, 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 the PowerPoint then? So we'll just say it's, it's a simple exercise, and then we'll see. So Oscar. So please, ushers, please ask them to keep coming in. Those outside, we, we, we need to. OK, so that's the, the, the Wi-Fi. Make sure that you, you scan it. Today is for us. Yesterday was for the big people. They are gone. Now today, let's see let's, <laughs> the, the opening and, and things like that. So we will just continue with it. The chaplain is in the house, so Reverend, please, you can come up stage, uh, uh, come to the front. Ushers, you can bring the chaplain to the place for us. So, is everybody connected? Okay, who is not, who is struggling to connect? Who is struggling to connect? Please raise your hand up. And then one, some of the technical team inside, please, um, you can help everybody so that we don't leave anybody behind. If you are struggling to connect or scan uh, the, the Wi-Fi, you, you just let somebody. So if we are ready, is everybody online? At least you should either connect to your Wi-Fi or if you have data and you can use your data, that's fine. So once we are done, in the next um, 10 seconds, the question will come and I'll give you, it's just, we are just doing some Kahoot this morning, just some three simple questions and then we start our session. So um, I think that now everybody has scanned this one so we can proceed. Okay. So you, you go to Kahoot, um, kahoot.it, Kahoot. Um, please, if you can, it's, it's up there, K-A-H, oh, Oscar, please, let me show, I'll read it for them. Okay, that's fine. K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. So then there's a pin there, you type in your pin. So waiting for players, let me see. I have zero players, wow. Okay, Maria, you use your name, your first name. Yes, Ransford, Ransford has also come. Let's see you, Elvis is in town. Karis, Joe, Safo. Okay, we have, um, okay. Please keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Everybody's coming. I like, I like it. And your name, King David.
Okay, who, who, who hasn't been successful? I just want to give everybody a fair start. Okay. Who, if you have, you have not been successfully logged on, please raise your hand and let us. Oh, please, somebody needs a help there. Another person needs help. Okay, so I think that um, I have 34. When I get to 50, I, I, I would start. We are almost at 50. For those who are joining us, you just go to kahoot.it, type in the code, and then we, we, we move on. Okay, so we can start the play. Now everybody is settling down, so we can start. So um, please, the first question. So the questions are, get to see the chief rapporteur. She, you'll be hearing from her so very soon. So you see the questions on your screen. That's the quiz. Which of the following is not a marker for student-centered approach to e-learning? You choose your answer. You know, Kahoot, how fast you are and how correct you are counts. Okay, so 14 people got it correct. The next question is just three questions. So as at this time, let's see who is leading. Amma Sewa is leading the scoreboard. So the next question. Which of these will make e-learning successful in any environment? Let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see, after this question, Dale is leading. <laughs> okay. okay, so the next question. <laughs> That's the last question. True or false? Let's see who is winning the prize. There's a prize. Ready? Oh, three people got it wrong. You need a receipt. <laughs> yeah. So let's see. At the end of who, who is winning? Ish. Who, who, who won? Who won? Let me see the name. Who used my, who is my, somebody used my account, who? <laughs> oh, somebody used my phone, uh, but, but um, the second is, the, oh, so please give the chocolate to, the, the person used my name, and since I am here, it means that, he, <laughs> so they'll get, oh, please clap for him, they'll get the prize, and who is Richard? Oh, Richard. I bent off it. So give, give him three, and then we, we will start. Okay, so we want to begin today's session with an open prayer from the chaplain of the university. And, and by the chaplain of the university is no other person than Reverend Dr. Joseph Echampom, who is the chaplain of the university, preparing us for mission 2024 in KNUST. Thank you. Good morning. Shall we please rise and pray? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dear Lord and Father, we praise and bless your name once again for the gift of our lives and the gift of today. 
We thank you for how far you have brought us in this conference. Thank you for the ideas that have been exchanged and the new experiences that have been gained. Thank you for what is in store for us today. We pray that you replenish all lost energies. You will prepare our minds and our hearts and give us teachable attitudes so that all that you have for us today will also be well imbibed and be a part of us as we go and practice everything we have for us. We commend all facilitators for today into your hands, asking for divine wisdom, grace, and abilities so they will be able to deliver as expected. As we journey through to the end of this conference today, be with us, O oh God, and help us come to a successful end to bring glory and honor to your name. Thank you for hearing our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please bless it. Thank you very much, Reverend Dr. Joseph Echampom. So we'll take the recap of day one, what happened yesterday, and that will be given by Dr. Mrs. Linda Amuakobanin, Chief Rapporteur. In fact, she was my course mate in school. We sat on the same room for four years. Please clap for her. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Um, you're welcome again to this conference. I'm not sure why we allowed Dale to participate, because he was the facilitator. But <laughs> Thank you, Dale. So as a recap of what happened here yesterday, um, the meeting started at 9.12 a.m. with an opening prayer by the Protestant chaplain, Reverend Dr. J.W. H. Hampong. The moderator welcomed all dignitaries and participants and invited the director of e-learning, Professor Erika Pewasante, to explain the purpose of the conference and the expected outputs. Professor spoke about the digital revolution in the tertiary education sector, which requires institutions to scale up and meet the IT advancement in teaching and learning. And he noted that some institutions and individuals have made good progress and that this conference is expected to be a central platform where stakeholders will collaborate and explore ways to use e-learning to bridge gaps in the tertiary education system. He stated that the conference was to help identify and showcase strategies to enhance the access accessibility, quality, inclusivity, and sustainability of the dig digitalization efforts. The conference is also aimed at sensitizing stakeholders in ensuring integrity and standards in the e-learning landscape, and he informed members of future annual conferences, which will be virtual, in-person, or both, and reminded the House about the upcoming e-learning week slated for 24th to 28th July which will feature a special online learning festival with interactive panel discussions. Then we had our first keynote speaker, Prof, um, sorry, before that, the Pro-VC, Prof Ellis, Usudabu brought us the VC's address in the presentation. The Vice Chancellor, Professor Mrs. Rita Akusia Dixon, reminded us of the unique point in history we are at and the fact that the e-learning Ghana conference was emphasizing the need for KNUSD to continue being forward thinkers to stay at the forefront of this renaissance in creating education without borders. And this forecast the time coming when universities will be without walls. She noted that KNUSD is committed to using e-learning and associated services to impact our communities continually. She encouraged all to embrace these new and correct ways of self-directed learning digital tracking and assessment, to mention a few, which will benefit both staff and students. She concluded that together we can create a world where education is truly without borders and commended the conference for being a beacon of hope and a catalyst for change. The first keynote speaker, Mr. Dale P. Johnson, the Director of in Digital Innovations from the Arizona State University in the USA, started his address by celebrating all participants for being a part of this historical moment. And this places Ghana at the center of the digitalization discourse. He noted that every discipline has the potential to use e-learning technologies and emphasized the need to find a good balance between technology and pedagogy. He further stated that the way to create change would be to build a 
new model, and each model would require adaptation and a thorough discussion on resources, systems, and personnel needed. He explained why it's important to to approach e-learning from a student-centered point of view using the following markers. Enrichment, which will enhance accessibility and quality. Enhancement, which focuses on interactive learning and, and improves accessibility, quality, inclusivity, and sustainability. Extend, which will just improve accessibility. And then expand, which bears fully online degrees, which would also enhance accessibility, having more students, inclusivity, including crossing international boundaries. And then sustainability, which would create opportunities to grow the brand. <clears throat> Sorry. He stated that these four markers depended on factors like policies that may restrict digitalization, available learning environment, student access to digital resources, having a model that aligns with an institution's strategic plan, adequate support staff, and ways to measure success. He concluded with four things that will make e-learning successful in any environment. And these are leadership support, faculty development in terms of pedagogy, technology, and group facilitation, instruction design services, which are crucial to restructuring content, and then infrastructure, which includes data analytics systems, digital e-learning environment, and video storage and serving. The special guest of honor, Honorable Esla Owusu Ekufo, the Minister of Communications and Digitalization, joined the conference virtually. Her presentation was titled, New Learning Supported by New Technologies, Creating an, an Enabling Environment for Digital Growth Through Sound Government Policies. In her address, Honorable Owusu Ekufo noted that significant Significant technology has allowed her to be part of the conference. And the paradigm shift in technology, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic, which has renewed the government concerns about delivering education to all. She noted, however, that some challenges, including inaccessibility to internet, high cost of data and digital tools, and then low levels of digital literacy, have hindered virtual learning. She reported on a number of items from parliament, including the government of Ghana through the Ministry of communications and digitalization's commitment to boosting access to quality, inclusive and sustainable education. And they are set to providing the right infrastructure for tools needed in learning. <clears throat> Sorry. The government of Ghana and the MCD have also made investments to aid internet connectivity across schools. And the tertiary education inclusion access program has provided internet services, thank you, to all educational campuses, including KNUSD. She also said that a digital infrastructure training for a thousand girls in basic coding across the country was ongoing, and that there were computer labs for JHS and SHS places to acquire digital skills. She reminded participants that sustainable programs require the collaboration of all stakeholders, and she looks forward to working to create an ecosystem that empowers learners, as she believes that this is the time for Ghanaian youth to tap into the digital technology for education. The opening ceremony was ended officially by the Pro VC with a closing prayer by the university chaplain. The Pro VC then opened the poster presentations after which pictures were taken. Um, by the way, this is e-learning. So those of you who missed the pictures, you can see the IT team. I'm sure they'll be willing to take your picture and Photoshop you into the picture. It will not be a bad idea at all. And um, parallel sessions were opened in three sub themes. The first sub theme was on accessibility. Mr. Jemfi Nkuma Ajabo, the Executive Director for Send Laws, chaired the SAP theme. Four speakers presented on the following topics. The first was an assessment of basic school teachers' utilization of ICT and play in teaching of mathematics in the Volta region of Ghana. The study identified the importance of play in learning math mathematics and recommended that ICT and play should be intensified to improve teachers' teaching and pupils' learning. The second was on comparative analysis of learning management systems usage among tertiary students in Ghana. This study had a limitation of small sample size with a limited number of tertiary students, but recommended that schools must have policies to regulate e-learning while encouraging more females to use it. The third was on e-learning in secondary education in Ghana and why Infancipim is on the move. This system outlined the setup that Infancipim currently has for e-learning and stated that they ensure that codes of 
codes and rules of GES are adhered to during the use of the system. The last was on management information systems and its impact on productivity in higher education, a case study of the colleges of education in Ghana. This system concluded that management information systems provide effective management and data collection, and so it is important to find ways to enhance, it, enhance its use. The second sub-theme was on quality. Prof. Zeno W. Wicks III, a retired Fulbright professor from South Dakota State University, chaired this sub-theme. Three speakers presented on the following topics. The first was on institutional support as a correlate of e-learning, an, an analysis of quality assurance framework in some selected institutions. This study emphasized the need to promote e-learning and ensure its effectiveness and resource allocation. They encouraged... <clears throat> I should drink the water. They encouraged um, improving capacity building for both faculty and staff. The second was on digitizing Ghana's curriculum, an alignment through digitization. This study stressed the need for government to obtain funding for digital st structure and align the digitized curriculum with the national educational goals and standards. And the third was on co-creating e-learning and blended learning pedagogies for teachers in Ghanaian basic schools, a case study with inductive implications. This study focused on the difficulty in navigating the wrongful use of e-learning platform among students. They proposed a conscious effort to ensure the appropriate use of e-learning platforms and encouraged a conscious effort to make e-learning and blended e-learning a concrete part in instructional and assessment pedagogies. The third and fourth sub-themes met together. That was on inclusivity and sustainability. And Professor Leonard Amekuji, the provost of the College of Science, KNUST, chaired this session. Two speakers presented as follows. The first was on developing an interactive multimedia to teach art history in senior high schools. This study validated the effectiveness of using multimedia tools in learning, as stated in other related studies, and recommended that the Ministry of Education considers adopting such approaches. The second was on a remediation of academic uncertainties, perspectives of teachers and students on flipped learning in colleges of education. This study observed that students play active roles in their learning processes and can collaborate and interact well with learning resources, peers, and teachers. After these, we had a presentation on Education Without Borders, Israel's Perspective, from Judith Rosenthal, the director of Aharon Ofri Training Center in Israel. She started by reiterating the potential of technology in our world today and why there is a need to regenerate things from aspects of the environment, economy, and educational systems. She stated that there's a disconnect between society and that transformation is much more important than change. She also said that the need to unlearn old knowledge and new, learn new things to grow and that in order to look at a school's transformation holistically, five key things will be imagination, creativity, change, communication, and intergenerational relationships. In closing, she encouraged participants to look for new ways of doing things from a human perspective. Dr. Benjamin, Jam Benjamin Jampo then moderated a plenary session which saw discussions on vital takeaways from the breakout sessions as well as how digitalization can improve accessibility, inclusivity, quality, and sustainability. This was all for yesterday. Of course, we ended with a cocktail and a live band session. Thank you very much. Oh, do it better for her. Do it better for her. Thank you very much. I was just thinking aloud, and I was like, wow. So tomorrow, how are we going to hear the recap of what happened today? Because this has refreshed my mind. Because yesterday I was moving around, but sitting through it, I think I have everything you guys uh, um, have had yesterday. Please clap for her one more time. Okay, so the next item we are going to listen to is a short um, documentary from the disab Richard Adade and Marco Stanley Nyako Disability and rehabilitation studies, a short documentary. 
And I would want us to have a dark room so that we can see it well. So we'll put off all the lights and then we focus on the screen. Don't be distracted by your phone and then enjoy the documentary. Thank you very much. special education and who requires special education or special educational needs. Special education is instruction that are specially designed to meet the unique needs of individuals with diverse educational needs. So we can say special education is the practice of education that accommodates individual differences, disabilities and special needs. Mostly when we hear special education, we quickly conclude it is for only children with disabilities or individuals with disabilities. But that's not the case. It goes beyond that. Even gifted and talented people or children require special education. Yes, if you want such students to succeed, you can't just follow the general instruction. There should be a special design instructions targeting only those in that category. And this becomes a little challenging when you are using a physical classroom. We know disabled persons mostly require special education. And without special instructional arrangement and resources availability, the education of such students, I mean, the, the student with disability stands a greater chance to suffer. Generally, people with disability find it difficult to achieve high educational goals as compared to those without disabilities. And as noted earlier, improper instructional planning and inadequate resources accounted for this. This unfortunate situation mostly led these people to suffer discrimination and end up in poverty. Most of the educational inequalities facing people with disability could be resolved through technology. So with the growing or emergence of technology, people with disability have the chance to adapt to modern life and feel equal in the different social group. In addition, they can acquire new abilities using modern technological devices and overcome any obstacle that could be on their way to happy life. For example, with the absence of sign language interpreters these days, deaf students can equally benefit from a class provided this is online using modern technologies such as Zoom. We know this application has a caption or transcript feature that can help in this instance. And the person can also ask questions using the, uh, the chat feature in the app. Regarding the blind, there are several mobile and computer applications such as Kibo. The Kibo works effectively on mobile phones. And we also have the JAWS. The full name is Job Access with Speech which is a computer screen reader program for Microsoft Windows that allow blind and visually impaired users to read the screen with a test to speech output. Again, there is this device, refreshable broad display, which is a tactile electronic device. And when you connect to another device such as computer, smartphone, or tablet, it will display the test as broad. So those who are familiar with the Bro system will appreciate this better. So once you, you point on the test, it will just display that in Bro for the person to feel it and know this is the word on the screen. So I recommend the university to get some of these for, for students. Additionally, there is the Bro and Browser that convert test to Bro format. And also we have the low vision students of which I'm aware we have some in our university. They can benefit with the use of magnifiers, the video magnifiers that enlarge the text for their reading. So as soon as we have this device, the low vision student can just have their document, textbook, articles, or whatever. They go to the place that they have this device there, put them there under the device, and they can read with the help of the device. 
So most of these applications and devices that I've mentioned can be used effectively if accessibility for people with disability is well considered in web or online content creation. So we should meet a certain standard before they can effectively use these devices and applications. As we may be aware, the e-learning center has already supported some students with disability in using the virtual classroom for their online exams. And they just ended the semester examination, I mean the first semester examination. Communication skills were done using the virtual classroom. And some of the students who were having some of the disabilities were not able to participate fully. But with the intervention of the e-learning center, uh, they were able to go through successfully. We had some students with cerebral palsy, and with this condition, they were not able to move with a normal pace because it takes them some time before they can click on the answer uh, that they, they want to choose. And the e learning center supported them. And I think additional time were also added for the students to finish their exams. And there were some other students with low vision, and these students too were also assisted by not being able to read the normal test, they have to find a way to enlarge the test for them to read and being able to answer their questions as well. Those with mobility difficulties or the mobility disabled too were assisted by getting um, a different venue for the exams. So all what I'm trying to put across is, though the e-learning directorate created or the e-learning were able to help these people to go through and finish their exams successfully. But when we are planning our activities online or even in the physical space, we should consider these people. We should think about how we are going to enable accessibility so that we don't leave them to be disabled. And in this 21st century, individuals' condition or impairment should never be seen as a barrier to attaining quality education. The Sustainable Development Goal 4 focuses on education and aims to ensure inclusive and equitable education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. This may be difficult to achieve without technology. Even in the physical space or environment, online systems are used to support teaching and learning. Uh, the KNUSC Virtual Classroom continues to uh, support lecturers in their teaching, learning and also assessment of students. So I see the reinforcement of the e-learning center to be a timely one uh, to help the university maintain its status as a global destination for quality education for all. And I'm very optimistic that in no time, most of these devices that were stated earlier will be secured by the university to enhance the learning experiences of students with disabilities. Let's, let's, let's put our hands together for him. In fact, the disability and rehabilitation studies have been with us from day one, and we want to appreciate their efforts. They've helped us, giving us all the insights and necessary support we need. And so please clap for them, clap for the department. They, they have been with us. But we want to achieve inclusivity, accessibility, and to get to go for, we need all these things to work for us to get there. Thank you very much. Now we go to the keynotes address for today. In fact, just straighten up small and be ready to jot some points down because you are going to be blessed today from the keynote speaker. But before then, please, those who just joined us, um, the little that you need to know is that the cables on the table, please don't pull them. Even though they are network cables, they are for the microphone. The moment you pull one, all of them will not work. So please make, make sure that you don't pull any of our network cables. If you need to use the washroom, you use the exit doors behind and then go around the building and enter through the back door and use the washroom. 
The Wi-Fi code will be displayed shortly for you so that if you need anything, you can, you can get it. Those who need any inquiry, any support, there are people at the front desk. They, they will help you during the break, and then you ask them anything you want. You want to change money, you want to do anything, please ask them. Once it's within the law, we would assist you and make sure you are helped. So to today's keynote speaker, he is the executive director of Center for National Distance and Open Schooling in Ghana under the Ministry of Education. He is currently a doctoral research student in business leadership at the Swiss Business School, Noble International Business School. He acquired his first degree in publishing administration from no other university, the best university, you know, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Kumasi. I, I should have even left it there and said from the best university and continued. Then you fill it in. He has an MBA in project management and a master's in computer science from the University of Phoenix in Arizona. So he, he was also from Arizona, USA. He has completed his LLM distance from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. He has a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Professional Studies, Accra, UPSA. He has certificates in programming from ITT Tech in Houston and communications from the Hawaii University in China. The person I'm talking about, Nana Jemfi Ejabo, has honed his critical skills in management, communication, IT, legal and problem solving skills over the past 20 years of professional experience in USA, China, and Ghana. He was part of the team that deployed most of the ICT initiatives on assessment and digital curriculum at the Houston Independent School District. His greatest strength lies in his ability to think critically and undertake objective analysis. He looks deeper into issues and harness team abilities to make decisions that will yield positive results. And your coming here today will yield positive results. And those online, please, your joining us today will yield positive results. Speaking to us this morning is Mr. Jemfi Nkrumah Ejabo, the Executive Director for Sendolos. Center for National Distance Learning and Open Schooling in Ghana. Please clap for him even as he mounts the stage. Wow. That was a, 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 a fantastic intro. Thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I recently did a presentation at uh, the University of Ghana, Legon, and uh, when they were introducing me, they said uh, he attended the Kumasi Legon. <laughs> so when I concluded my presentation, I also said thank you for inviting me to the Accra KNUST. <laughs> Good morning once again. Prof. Rita Akusia Dixon, the Vice Chancellor of the Noble University KNUST, the Pro VC, Professor Alice Ousu Dabo, Prof. Appel, my good brother, Minister for Communication. Ms. Madam Esla Ousu, all provost in the house, academias, chaplain, experts in ed tech, fellow speakers, my media family, ladies and gentlemen, I deem it a great pleasure to be here today to present to you a topic Where's my slides, please? Okay. 
All right, the topic today on blurring the lines of formal and informal learning, addressing the questions of accessibility, quality for effective e-learning. Good. I bring you greetings from the Honorable Minister of Education, Honorable Dr. Yao Osea Dukum, the entirety Ministry of Education, and my staff at the St. Louis. Again, my name is Nana Jemfi Ejabo, the Executive Director of St. Louis. St. Louis is the Center for National Distance Learning and Open Schooling. Our mandate is very clear, to infuse ICT into education to make sure every child, irrespective of location, will have access to quality education. This agency was being established since 2002 under the leadership of ex-president Ajekum Kufo. The name there was President Special Initiatives on Distance Learning. We have been in existence for the past 22 years now. And as I retreated, our mandate is very clear to infuse ICT into education. Permit me to bring you up to speed before I walk into the slides, what we have done to give you some valuable insights on the state of distance education in the country. What is happening in the country now, we know that digital education is now being infused in every facet of our life. The health sector is no different. When it comes to education, we have taken a greater heed in that. The first slides will walk you through what we have done in the country as an uh, agency to support distance education. Okay. All right, so in my intro, as I said, there's the need to blur the lines between formal and informal learning. The significance of e-learning in our rapidly evolving world cannot be downplayed. We are now in a world where education transcends traditional boundaries and has become an organic part of our daily lives. By erasing the rigid lines that separate formal and informal learning, we know we are open to a world of possibilities and effective e-learning, which Sandlos continues to pursue in all earnest. So just like we retreated in the introduction, St. Louis have done a couple of things to see how we can bridge the gap between traditional sector to the digital part. Most of this uh, presentation, most of the education that we have been doing in the country, you could see that about 70% of our educational delivery is still in the traditional setup, that is brick and mortar. Right at COVID-19, during that time, a lot of uh, students were being displaced from school. Over 1.2 million students lost education. It was St. Louis who provided a system that they could leverage on it to study. The system I'm talking about is called the iBox. And the iBox is, uh, is an intelligent box system. It's an offline learning management system. When we say something is offline, I think I'm at the right place is a, a, a use nothing connectivity. We can deploy it to any localities in the country. If you don't have connectivity, you can leverage on it and still study. So it was the iBox that the country leveraged on it to make sure that we still have education. That is the offline version. We have the online version called the iCampus. That one, you need connectivity to be able to leverage on it. All the solutions we placed for digital education was for SHS1, SHS2, and SHS3. You could see that there was no intervention for the foundation, that is basic one, two, three, going up to JHS. So quickly, send laws, as we are mandated, we need to come up with more solutions for that. And in, when it comes to edtech solution, the place that you need most intervention is at the foundational level too. That is the F, L, and N. That is foundational literacy and numeracy. You need to make sure that they also leverage on technology to teach. 
So we had to work with stakeholders like UNICEF, UNESCO, and other partners in the game to come up with a platform for the basic students. And now we are working on what we call the Ghana Learning Passport. And that one will focus at the basic level. So anyone from primary one to JHS three, through the leadership of the minister, we are going to intervene there. We want to make sure we create a pipeline of students, experts in when it comes to digital education, so they can leverage on all the tools when they get to the tertiary level. So that has been the focus of the minister. Permit me to say this. Since the minister became the minister for education, he has made it clear in his first term, in his first days in office, that he wants to reimagine education. He wants to transform education, leveraging on ICT. He never means worse on that. So you could see the intervention when it comes to STEM education that the minister is bringing. And the pivotal part or the backbone of such of these intervention is housed or is being leveraged by sandlots. We are at the pivotal level. We have to, we are the backbone to support all of what is going on. So most of our intervention is focused on what the minister and the country as a whole wants to achieve. The government already introduced the free SHS, we know about that, and it's bringing a lot of students to our schools, especially uh, at the SHS level. They will all be coming to the tertiary. So my slides will speak on some of the preparation we have made to support at the tertiary too. Okay, I already spoke about the send loss mandate. Okay, before you can achieve anything ICT in education, there has to be an ICT policy. There are five critical things that you have to do to make sure nationally EdTech is being sustained. One of them is policy. Yesterday we spoke in-depthly about policy. Policy is very crucial. So at the ministry or at the national level, we want to come up with an ICT policy. And we already had one. It started from 2003. The first ICT policy for the country was done in 2003. And it went under reform in 2005 and 8. Now, 2015, we did another reform on that, all to capture the newness of things that is coming around. We know how many generations in terms of uh, industrial revolutions. Right now, we are in the fourth industrial revolution, yes or no? We are in the fourth, right? But I can guarantee you fourth and fifth is now being coupled together. The first industrial revolution started during the time when we used steam power to power the ship. The second was when Con Edison was sitting in some way in New York to make sure he come up with uh, electricity to support how to use electricity for mass production. All these intervention or revolution, Africa, we did not take much heed Second revolution, not. It was only third that we took glimmers of electronics, that we started to use Nokia phones, and you could see some uh, phones that we all started to use. Fourth industrial revolution is here, biotechnology, artificial intelligence. The minister wants us to make sure we come up with a new policy that will capture some of these interventions, all these digital skills that is needed in this revolution. So we are working on that new policy that will speak to all the newness in ICT. I already spoke about the send loss mandate. We go to the next. Okay, so that's the ICT policy. All right, some of the government intervention, that is the free SHS, we spoke about that. The free SHS is to make sure SDG4 agenda, that talks about access in education, that talks about quality in education, that talks about equity in education. We know that when it comes to education, many of our continental leaders has made some major pronouncement when it comes to education. Let me take the first person who spoke about education. It's our own Kofi Annan. He said education is a human right. When we talk, when we say something is a human right, which is boldly sitting in chapter five of our, of our constitution, you could see that every human being should have education. So Kofi Annan knows that. And we, if you talk about uh, Nelson Mandela, he spoke about to develop a nation 
The greatest weapon is through education. That was a deep statement they all made. The final person came from South Africa, Oliver R. Tambo, and I quote, he said, any country that fails to invest in education or invest in his people through education does not deserve its future. All these people are making very deep statement. At that time, the statement they made was about traditional education. Imagine if they were living today, they would say ed tech education. It's very important. Education is now in transition. So they are speaking to us that we need to make sure and grab ed tech education. So the government, the president knows how important education is and the Ministry of Education we also know. So we brought about the free SHS education to make sure every child, irrespective of your location, your disability, you could also have access to education. That is the free SHS. The free TVET, any country that would develop to a certain level, you need to make sure your TVET is working. So Ghana, we have done what we call the free TVET, and the government of Ghana has intervened with that, and it's working. You could see a lot of TVET centers coming up, most of them are being renovated, machines are being done, and all of this is coming from the government. And some of them, we at St. Laws are intervening. Now we are creating content for TVET. Whatever they do in the physical engineering, we are mimicking it on the online. So we call it the virtual labs. We have labs at content uh, at St. Laws that uh, mimics electronics, it mimics electricity, uh, electricals, and machinery and other stuff at our level. STEM education. STEM education is what the minister is championing for. That talks about science, technology, engineering, and maths. And the provost for, uh, uh, the past provost, that was uh, Professor Aduma Samoa. He's the STEM advisor for the Ministry of Education. The focus is to make sure that we improve and we push more students to take STEM education. Any country, if you develop in terms of your socioeconomic development, you need to make sure you produce a lot of people in STEM-related areas. If you look at the country now, we are at 60 40%. 40% is at STEM-related courses, and 60% is humanities. We want to tweak it. We want to make sure that at least 60% STEM education and 40% will do the other ones. All right, so the status of distance education at all levels, before I go to my topic for today. Most delivery has been virtually in person at various schools and universities across the country. Most of our universities have some online learning management system but have been large, largely in person. You could see that uh, largely in person, like uh, our brother uh, Dell spoke about, and in Arizona, they have 85,000 online courses, and they are doing 85,000 in person. I don't know any university in Ghana now that is offering that much. Probably, oh, you can help me on that. So we should be able to look in to get to that level, whereby we can offer a lot of online education. The status now is not very uh, uh, fair towards online learning management. So most of the private and public schools have some form of interventions, like the iBox, the iCampus, the Edmodo, and uh, soon to be implemented, the learning passport. There is no national learning management system for tertiary and pre-tertiary. That's a big one. In the country now, you could see everyone is doing something, some sort of ed tech. They are doing some sort of intervention. There is no national platform in the country. We have spoken about that. The minister has taken heed. If you look at many countries in the USA, even in China, China was doing some sort of uh, online education. The moment they has a universal uh, uh, learning management system, you could see the uh, ed tech went to a different level. Ghana, we also have to have a national platform. So the government, we are looking at the open university for the tertiary level, and we are going to come up with a national platform for the pre-tertiary so everyone could be on that system. So we can manage it well, monitor to see what is going on, and infuse the quality we are looking for. So that is something that we are looking to do at St. Laws to support the ministry. 
All right, so some of the priorities from St. Laws. We want to strengthen the capacity of St. Laws to, uh, to handle expansion of service provision. We also uh, we have the second edition of National Digital Distance Learning Conference. The first digital learning conference happened last year, and Professor Appel and most of you here came. Why did we do the National Distance Digital Learning Conference? You could see that there's a lot of uh, interventions in the ed tech space in the country. If you ask UNESCO, if you ask UNICEF, if you ask TTEL, all of them are doing something, all the universities. I think KNUST, you have what we call the V class. If you go to Legon, they have Sakai. If you go to uh, most of the universities, they have their own thing. But if you want to have a data, or you have a government agency that will lead the front. You couldn't find none. So St. Laws, through the leadership of our minister, first held the first national digital learning conference in Labadi Beach to bring all the stakeholders in the industry, in the ed tech space, to come together for us to understand the space. It was a three days event. The first day looked at the impact so far. What are the challenges that they are facing in terms of ed tech? What are some of the experience they can share with us in terms of ed tech? So UNESCO gave the aversion, UNICEF, KNUST, all the universities came around for us to see some of the challenges they are having. So at the national level, how we can support and, and fix the issues together. The second day looked at the, at the evidence day, if you have done an intervention, like here in USD, you have done V-class. What are the evidence? How many students are taking classes on the V-class? UNESCO spoke about emergency remote delivery. What are the impact in the country? Show us the evidence, show us the data. Whatever we are doing when it comes to air tech, it has to be backed by data. So give us the evidence. So we all looked at that and we decided how to move forward on the third day, how to come up with framework, a national framework to guide all this. So I was glad to be invited to this e-learning conference because it's some of the, the, the solutions that can fix the national issue of making EdTech very attractive for everyone, every student to take courses online. So that is the National Digital Learning Conference. I already spoke about the uh, learning my, uh, passport and the Minecraft education. I'm sure most of you know about Minecraft. Who knows about Minecraft? Yes, Mr. Dell, you know about Minecraft, right? And you. Any other person, Minecraft, that's good. That's St. Louis people. You know about Minecraft. Okay. So what Minecraft does is they apply, they use gamification in anything you do. So if students, if they are learning using, let's say, uh, mathematics or English or any area, they could use gamification through the content to keep the students attracted or attached to the, 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 the learning process and still gain the results we are looking for. So now we have brought Minecraft here to partner with St. Laws to have the St. Laws Minecraft education in Ghana. And we have started with the basic school and I know we will get to the tertiary level to make sure content education, content production will be more attractive. So that is the Minecraft uh, education there. We have the master flash at St. Laws. So that one is an encrypted flash drive that once you have educational content on it, you could have it and study all the GES approved content. Yes, we are expanding the iBox and the iCampus. Currently, we have close to 50% of the iBox being deployed in the school. Usability of the iCampus is close at 70% and is supporting educational delivery in the country. We know some of the schools, you go in at some term and some will come out and others will go in. Once you are out, you can leverage on the iCampus to study. The content on it are all GES approved content, so you don't miss anything. So this is really helping and is supporting the agenda of making sure every child receives education irrespective of location. We are also working on to build the teachers, their capacity in the use of e-learning system. When you talk about e-learning, most teachers, the acceptance is not there. Let's face the fact. 
most of them, because of their capacity building, the lack of training that they have been gotten, we have done extensive research. You could see that teachers are kind of not ready to accept it. St. Louis is coming up with a lot of training for the teachers so they can build their capacity in that regard. There are three things we focus for the teachers. We want to make sure their experience is high, they build the learning experience, they get the same outcomes they get as the traditional level, and also to experiment using the EdTech. So we are teaching them how to use all the digital tools in that regard. So production of virtual labs, I spoke about that, digitization of content and other stuff. All right, these are some of the pictures from the conference. You could see the uh, minister, the deputy minister, some people from Coursera and other stuff. St. Louis, we don't do anything in, uh, in isolation. We work with other key stakeholders. We have other sister agencies we work with. Because I know when it comes to ed tech, you cannot achieve it alone. It's, a, it's an ecosystem. It's a process that you need to collaborate with your sister agencies and partners. That is why we are here today at Kane University to learn what they are doing, to see nationally how we can support what they are doing, because there has to be collaboration. Where you fall short, somebody will have the expertise, so we come together. And we don't look at only the, the local market or in Ghana alone. We also work with other partners from the international market. So these are key collaborating agencies we work with. Okay, these are St. Louis as of today. You can see the pictures now. We want to build an ecosystem there. So we have content creation studios. We have a van that we go out to do uh, most of our discussions and interventions. We use that. All of this is uh, through the help of the minister. So now to look at the topic for today, blurring the lines between formal and informal learning. The traditional demarcation between formal and informal learning is no longer sufficient to meet the needs of the modern education. There is no, there is no time to erase that there should be any demarcation between the traditional and digital. This is now. When COVID-19 came, you could see that our educational system was under severe attack. So this topic is very fantastic. It resonates better to what we are doing nationally. So at the point two, you could see integrating formal and informal learning. Learners can benefit from the flexibility and customization that informal learning provides. With the informal learning, uh, let's say EdTech platform, you could even customize your contact, you could customize the setup and other stuff, and flexibility. Students could be at wherever and they can still learn. How, uh, my student, how are you enjoying your online delivery? Reporter, how do you enjoy it? I mean, the, the, since we have the online platform, is it supporting you or is taking away some good part of your? Can you answer that for me? Okay, so since the online system came into the academic, it has actually benefited us uh, in a lot of ways because sometimes you know you have something to, you're able to do two things at once. So for the online system, it has been of great benefit to us. Very good. So you could see the benefit from a student voice that they are garnishing from the ed tech interventions. At first, you could be at a place, and if you don't have trans transportation to go to your campus, if you can't get there, then it means you cannot receive education. But now, at any part, at the convenience that you have, if you have a tablet, any access to digital system or a tablet, you could have education. So long as you have connectivity, yes, you can have it. Even if you don't have connectivity, you can upload or download the content in an online mode and study in an offline mode. So it's really helping and affordability is also key because most in our tertiary institutions now, I don't know how much they are paying for uh, the, uh, what's the name, hostels now. It's a lot of money. Now you could stay somewhere and you don't really have to come on campus unless you have something pressing or a course you have to be there and still study because of digital intervention. So it's very important. So informal learning often 
emphasizes real-world experiences, practical skills, and contextual understanding. And also informal learning is often driven by intrinsic motivation. Okay, let's get into some report. Statistics from the 2021 population and housing census showed that a total of 1.2 million plus children of school going age from 14 to 17 years in Ghana were not attending school. That is a deep one. I mean, that is very crucial because 1.2 million children of the same school going age, that is a report, it's a data that we receive, are not going to school. It's very crucial. And UNICEF came about with what we call the learning loss. If I ask you what the learning loss, close to some of our students between the ages from four to 10 or up to 10 years, they cannot read for even for comprehension. That is a problem in our shores too. So if 1.2 million students are not in school, can you ask yourself, where are they now? They may be in the streets and what are they doing? But if we infuse ICT, if we are careful, if we're able to intervene with ed tech solutions, some of them is because of loss of maybe a parent or affordability or certain issues, they could also leverage on such interventions and study. So that is a crucial one. We have to also look at it. So out of this, 942 had never been enrolled in a school before. And the government has not relented in its effort to provide education for all. I already spoke about free SHS and other free TVET interventions. So that is that what we are talking about. So in February this year, the government launched the ambitious Ghana Education Outcome Project, and which is expected to, which is expected over 70,000 children out of school. So what this project focuses is, we want to see the learning outcomes. Most of the times, if you do interventions, what are the outcomes? You don't intervene or come up with initiatives without seeing the results. So we, at the national level, working with all the stakeholders like the universities, we want to make sure that we get the outcomes, we receive the results that that intervention is going to yield. So that is why we came about with the Education Outcome Project, and it's the headquarters is at uh, Sendlos. Okay, some challenges confronting the formal educational sector. Yes, one of them is geographical barriers which limit educational opportunities and affect individuals in undeserved or rural communities, fixed schedules which can conflict with work commitment, family responsibilities and personal circumstances. There are also financial constraints and the lack of interest to participate in education among others. So all of these are challenges that is confronting the formal sector that the informal sector can help to resolve them. Most of them, because of fixed shadows, they cannot come to school. Some of them have family responsibilities. I know most of you, during the time when you are going to school, like myself, I have a lot of family responsibilities. I had to travel to places to sell before I can even get back to raise money. That was somewhere in the 80s. Now, if we would have had this interventions that we have, especially these days, you could leverage on it to study because or sometimes some of the recordings can even be saved for you so you don't have to rush to school because we have what we call the on-demand videos. So I could see that the informal education that we could talk about or we are speaking about now could actually support educational system in the country. So accessibility through e-learning. Yesterday we spoke a lot about accessibility through e-learning. Now you could see that for us to give a lot of assess, assessment or a lot of accessibility for students, we have to intervene with technology. We need to make sure we come up a lot of ed tech solutions. So that is why this is very crucial. When you talk about e-learning, the need is now and we can allow to sit aloof, not to take heed when it comes to e-learning. E-learning platforms and online courses provide access to a wide range of educational programs, regardless of your location. I spoke about my iBox and the iCampus. We have the V-Class and other stuff. 
if you are in, let's say, Kwasi, Jima, Adesu, regardless where you are, you could have access to the content because of the iBox. The selection of the iBox is done by St. Laws and the Ministry of Education. We will just bring it there and we will place the content. The content is being created at St. Laws and it's GES approved. Uh, teachers that produce the content. In your case, tertiary, I know you are producing content here. So if you have an offline devices, you could take it to the students, let's say in their hostels or wherever they are locating, so they can also leverage on it to study at their own time. Open educational resources such as open textbooks, videos and educational materials are freely available online. So you could see the flexibility we spoke about because you can, you can learn at your own time. You could go online, download the resources at your own time. And at St. Laws, we have what we call the Open Educational Resources Platform, which we are going to make it available to the tertiary, the pre-tertiary, and the basic school. They should be able to assess the content on it. And most of the content are free from copyright. So it's not something that you will be getting yourself into issues. So we will start to publicize, to get publicity on that, so most of you can leverage on it to see what is going on. Now we don't have a lot of tertiary content, but through the Open University, we are going to work with all the universities to make sure that we get content for the tertiary level, so you can also get access to the content when it comes to the Open University level. So we talk about accessibility, the ubiquity of smartphones and mobile devices has opened up new avenues for learning. Because of the e-learning, the digital education we are talking about, it has opened new avenues for us to look at how to learn. At your own will, whatever, wherever you are located, you could learn at any discipline, any avenues you could also learn, regardless of what you are doing. Micro learning with the bite sized and focused learning models allows learners to engage in short bursts of learning that can be easily into their uh, daily routines. So, all of these are opportunities that the informal sector is bringing to our shores of education. It talks about the same thing, so I'll just go to. Okay, so one other part we have to look critically when it comes to uh, e-learning and the traditional system or the informal and the formal education is quality. Yesterday we spoke about quality and quality is a process. It starts from every level, from the content creation from human resources. I spoke about the six P's in the educational, edtech educational ecosystem. Today, I think yesterday, I gave the four. The first one, we already spoke about the policy. The product, of course, is eat technology that we are selling. We need to look at the pedagogy. Every intervention has its own pedagogy. So with these in the ecosystem, you should achieve the quality we are looking for. We need to look at the people who are going to play a major role in the ed tech delivery system. The people from support staff, from content uh, providers, from teachers, from students, all of them are people. In our case, we have ICT coordinators. We need to make sure we train them, so they are the people. And of course, we need to also look at the provision. If you are talking about quality, you need to look at the provision. The provision focus on how would you provide for funds? How do you sustain the ed tech interventions? So funds acquisition, how do you work with your stakeholders? That comes in the provision. So accreditation problems is also an issue we need to look at. We need to make sure that the fidelity of assessment is very weightier. Because if you talk about, if you receive a PhD online, if I'm to ask most of you, if you receive a PhD in your traditional classroom, and those that receive their PhD online, which one would you say is weightier? Senior. Which one, online or in classroom? Classroom, thank you. That is what we get all the time. When we go to places, they said the fidelity of assessment, because of that, the weight of the degree you receive from online is not that weightier compared to traditional setup. But I want to prove it to you. I want to inform all of you that it's the same now. 
gone are those days that we used to see the traditional intervention as superior compared to online. Let's bring our mind on something. When it comes to online education or training, if you look at astronauts, how do they receive their training before they go up to the, you know, the, the, the sky to fly their rockets? Please, can, can somebody tell me about that? They use online intervention to train. How would they go there and now practice the actual mission? So that tells you that if online delivery, if you do it well, you can receive the results you are looking for. But the problem is quality. The fidelity of assessment. What are the assessment tools we are placing in place? At St. Louis, we look at quality from all these angles. And when we talk about assessment, it starts from five angles. It has to be preparation. What are the preparation you put on ground or you put in place? What are the preparation towards your examination? The second part is examination. We have a lot of digital tools to use to mark our exams, but we are facing problems in the country when it comes to the theory. The objects is easy, A, B, C, and D, yes or no? The objects we can mark it, but when it comes to theory, it's been a problem. But guess what? AI, artificial intelligence, that we are deploying now at St. Laws at the ministry to support WIEC and other places to actually mark the theory part. We resolve that part. People think that if you receive online degree, the weight is down. We are working on that. Of course, we need to look at analysis and report. All of them ties into the quality bit. So what we are doing is the government of Ghana has shown commitment to e-learning at the national level. Processes are underway to establish the first open university I already spoke about. St. Louis and GTEC are coordinating this effort. That is the open university. Not alone, we are going to work with all of you, the universities, because you are stakeholders. When we talk about open universities, the universities come to play. And the stakeholders, UNICEF, everyone in the educational ecosystem will be part of this. And again, St. Louis and GTEC are going through regulations to establish e-learning to make sure a step towards diffusing the idea that it is of inferior quality to traditional classrooms. So we are going to put a lot of measures to diffuse that thought in people's mind. So GTEC and St. Laws, we are working together and other stakeholders that are coming to join us to put measures in place to fix that issue of, of the weight of degree. Okay, so again, still on the ensuring the quality of e-learning. The internet is flooded with information which makes it essential to discern reliable and accurate sources. Also, ensuring the credibility of online resources is crucial to maintain the quality of e-learning as learners need access to accurate and up-to-date information to support their learning. We should encourage the formation of online communities and peer support network. All of this is talking about quality. How do we achieve quality? We need to uh, make sure our peers, they support groups, because if the learning online, if we don't make it attractive, build a community, we are going to lose on that, because traditionally, you can go to the non-residents now, you could go to the libraries. Most students, they have their groups they are studying. We need to mimic that online. The government is pushing for that. We are going to use softwares like Flips and other stuff to achieve the same thing online. So peer supports can also be fostered. Still on the ensuring quality, it is imperative to understand shifting to e-learning calls for modification in the way we do things. Of course, it's still on the quality. Quality assurance. Okay, so in conclusion of my topic, I want to make sure that the wave of technology has changed educational delivery forever. The four walls of classroom is no longer a barrier to attain basic education. St. Laws is poised to help to achieve all sustainable development goals through EdTech solutions to make sure there is no learning loss during pandemics. What this slice is talking about in my conclusion, we have a lot of SDG goals that was being set. If I ask you the SDG for most of you or all of you knows about that, but the SDG 5, that talks about gender equity, is very crucial. We are looking at that to make sure we will use edtech intervention to also resolve that. 
Right now, data is suggesting that most girls are not taking online classes because when it comes to digital interventions, girls are not so much interested. The ministry, we are working with other stakeholders like the Ministry of Communication to see how we can bring girls in ICT. So that is something we are working on. And also the SDG 17 agenda, that talks about collaborating to achieve goals. We are working to make sure we can achieve it. To further conclude, I want to state that uh, our brother, Prof. Appel, you have done well. Let's clap for him for what he has achieved. <laughs> Together with the team, this has been a fantastic initiative. At the ministry level, the minister, we support this. St. Louis sitting at the national level, we support what you have done. I want to assure you that we are going to work together. We are going to make sure you achieve a greater height. Like I mentioned, GTEC is also part of it because education has moved to the digital level. Education now is in the ed tech space. We need to support to build our students, to make sure that we infuse that confidence in them, to make sure that every child, irrespective of location, should have access to education, and to build their confidence that if they cannot fly, they can learn how to run. If they cannot run, they can learn how to walk. Even if they cannot walk, they can learn how to crawl because all of them is a movement. Thank you so much. Thank you so, 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 so very much for such a wonderful presentation. And before we move to the next item, I just want you to be reminded of the fact that Bella Kwa has, this is Bella Kwa. They have helped us with water for this conference. And the Martinek Enterprise, Martinek, they, they are into uh, furniture and things like that. So if you need furniture, computer desk, they, they've also supported us for this conference. ASI Limited, I'm a, it's a construction firm. If you want to go into real estate, build something, you can talk to them. And then Aquafields Construction Limited, they, they are also into all the constructions that go around. So if you need anything, um, you can talk to them. They have been of significant help to us. Thank you very much, Bell Aqua, Mortinec, Acid Limited, Aquafields. And if you are here and your company's name hasn't been mentioned, it means that we've not heard from you. You can book your slot for, for next year. The, the doors are open so that um, we will fix you. We don't, we, we don't want to close the gates uh, because we book it now for next year's conference and sponsor us and make sure that next year's e-learning Ghana conference will be bigger and bigger and bigger. So tell your companies, tell your friend, tell any business you know that if he wants a place to put his money, he should check e-learning Ghana conference, KNUST. So please, that is that. Please put your hands together for the sponsors again. With this, just before we go for a break, there's a, a little exercise we are going to undertake. The exercise is um, reflections on what has just been said. A lot has been said by the speaker, blurring the boundaries of formal and informal learning, addressing questions of accessibility and quality for effective e-learning, discussion points. So what did you hear? What, what do you have to contribute? What are the things that got your attention? Are there things that you need further clarification? This is discussion. And so if we need the speaker to clarify, he would clarify. If you have an intervention, you, you will do. So that, that, that is, 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 is there. So I'll, I'll do it this way. I'll take from this session, that session, this session. Oh, this session, you are fantastic. Please clap for them. It doesn't mean you are not, but they have raised their hand first. So we'll take your inputs and then your comments. Okay. Uh, Please, you mention your name and... Um, your university or you are, you, are, you are calling from? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I am an associate professor from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. Uh, the, uh, the speaker spoke about the uh, dropout or out of school children. And he also talked about the policy to inculcate them 
so that I can go back to school. But I'm wondering, about, I, I, in line with that policy, what is their preparation for affordability? Because he spoke about those children, maybe they are open or they don't have anybody to take care of them. How can such students afford the cost of educating them through the you know, ICT program? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if, if there are questions, let's take two more, then he addresses them. So if there are questions, you can, we'll do that one, then we we'll go to the discussion. So I'll take from there, and then I'll come to this side. Okay, Prof, yes. please your name, and, and please you can put your microphone off once you are done speaking so that we don't get feedback. Okay. Thank I'm, you. I'm Dr. J. Odelola from University of Ibadan. Uh, this one caught my uh, attention during the presentation that uh, the establishment of virtual laboratory, the establishment of, the establishment of virtual laboratory. I know this, this has been the bin of uh, joining the, uh, this uh, e-learning of a team. And this has caused them not to have joined because of, uh, I, I mean, those um, uh, subjects that are practical related, like science, uh, physical education, and other thinking that how would they now do their practical when it's just uh, not face-to-face? Uh, uh, -face. So I don't know if the speaker can clarify again, has there been any technology or any scenario and, or any, to prove to us that this virtual laboratory is in place? Okay. The second one is that uh, you are talking about why teachers are not interested. You talk about... The, 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 the capacity building. I'm now uh, asking you, what is the place of welfare in improving the participation of teachers? Thank you. Okay, the last one, and then he answers that. Okay. And please, this side. I'll come, the next set will come to this side. Okay. Yeah, I wish yeah. to. Please, your name and where you are from. Okay, John Akwesi, I'm from uh, uh, National President, Ghana National Association of Authors and Publishers. Okay. Good. I wish to commend uh, Sandlos. We, we, we are witnesses of the great works you are doing in Ghana, and particularly impressed to hear that you schooled at uh, KNUST. That's great. Now, now it's a club. Yes. <laughs> now... Ours is of a challenge. We know that in literary works, works like poetry, works like prose, and so on and so forth, require artistic delivery blended with uh, uh, education to be able to produce books that are of standard, books that are of quality, before NACA then comes in to approve them to be made available on any platform for students to access. Just before you finish, please explain NACA. Not everybody is in Ghana. Okay. okay. NACA is the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment. What okay. happens is that after we have created content, that is the books, authors and publishers, we send them to the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment to approve of them before we make them public, print them out for public consumption. Now, how is St. Louis going to make a useful blend of these creative potentials in order that the change that is coming will not disrupt existing businesses in terms of <laughs> publishing? Because we have KNUST producing students for publishing every year. So if technologies are coming, how are we going to build a synergy so that technology will not come to wipe away existing businesses and create others. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm sure your association members will vote for you. Association <laughs> president of publishers. So that's that. the last one and he answers. From here then, we'll come to this side after this set. All right. Thank you very much. I'm Adai, an instructor from NMTC, military hospital. Uh, yes, sir. The, the, thank you. <laughs> The presentation Please was... Please switch off the military hospital. 37. 37 military hospital. Okay. 
the presentations, uh, you did a very good work in the presentation, but knowing the governments of developing countries in Ghana for that matter, to what extent are you immune against political influence? Because politicians will come, politicians will come, and they can decide to rubbish all these things you are talking about. To what extent are you immune against political influence? If they change government, can we be sure this thing can go on or it will just be packed somewhere for a new thing to come up? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would, uh, he would answer them and then other speakers can fill in. And then when we are done, we'll come to this session. So, Nana, you, you All you right. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. So, uh, let me take the first question uh, or comment about uh, how those kids on the street, how we intend to, to, to bring them back to class. I think there's an agency called the Complementary Education Agency, a CEA. Uh, St. Louis is working with them. That's an agency under the Ministry of Education. Uh, through the leadership of uh, the Minister, Honorable Dr. Yao said, which we are working with them. And also we, we received support from Commonwealth of Learning to see how we can work together to build edtech solutions for these kids. In the area of affordability, like I said, uh, we have several areas we are looking for to make sure, since we have intervened with free SHS and free TVET, there is going to be a CBE education, that complementary education being free. So we want to also make sure that they will come in without being charged or anything of that sort. So uh, Commonwealth of Learning is working with us. The Ghana government is also looking at it and other stakeholders to make sure, because already we know that they are on the streets and uh, they don't have anything. So affordability and payment and other stuff, we need to look at it. That is why it's very important. So we have started with stakeholders engagement. We are making sure that a detailed research is being established. Any intervention we do at St. Louis, as for that much, or by extension, the Ministry of Education is backed by extensive research, a missed method like you, you taught us yesterday, a missed method approach that we don't depend on only uh, quantitative and other stuff. So once those research and engagement is completed, we can speak about it well, but there's an extensive work that has been done already. The key word here is we want to build a sustained digital pathways for these kids to also come to class using digital means without paying anything. So on that, that is that. Uh, in the issue of virtual labs, it's very important, you know, because uh, if you do TVET uh, using virtual means, you know, at that time, let's say if you are learning machinery or if you are doing anything electrical or it could be anything that is uh, joinery, you should be going to the physical engineering, going to the, 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 the place or the workshop. What we are doing is we are working on virtual labs with Open University UK. They have an in-depth experience in that. And the first year, second year people will use the virtual labs to at least introduce them into machinery. So at the time they are about to come out, we will expose them to the physical engineering and workshop. So it's not like they are not going to touch the tools. No, they will. Because you can bring them out without knowing how to even hold a, a saw. That will be a disaster for the country. So there will be in and out sort of. But now if you go to most of our TVET, you could see that most of the workshop could house a number of people. And we have an influx of students. So we need to use other sustained means to intervene. So others could also receive education. but not compromising on quality and other stuff. So all of this, we are looking at it very well. In the issue of uh, uh, policy and uh, w whatever we are doing, if it's going to be sustained, if there is a change of government, we know the political landscape and the environment in any country, not Ghana alone, most of the times when a, a new president or a new government comes to play, uh, usually some of the interventions that is not very uh, important to him, he can, you know, skew it. So we need to make sure that it's backed by policy and uh, receive some sort of cabinet and parliamentary approval. So all of this is being uh, uh, boldly imprinted in our policy we spoke about, the ICT policy that we are sending to cabinet to make sure they can 
uh, approve it. So all of the interventions, most of them is already being approved, the iBox, the iCampus, but the new ones is in the new ICT policy we are about to send out. So if the president and the uh, parliament, the cabinet are sent on it, it will be difficult for a new person or a government to come in and overthrow them. So we are working on that. We have that in mind. In terms of the publishing, of course, we are, I am a student, I'm a product from here. We don't want to intervene anything without thinking about the people, their source of income and other stuff. But if you look at other places, other uh, uh, countries, we have what we call the e-books, I'm sure you know. We have the candle fire, we have other things. That publishers are making good money. We need to look at how we can emulate or mimic some of them. So if you have a book in a, in a hard copy, or a paperback, we can reduce them into digital online and a portal for you and give you the copyright and establish an e-commerce page that when somebody click your book, you receive the money. That is what the government wants to intervene. So we are not taking away anybody's business, but to improve on it, to even make you more, more uh, accessible and people so you can make more benefits on that. So that is what we are doing in, in that regard. So we have you in mind, and we are going to do the e-publishing too, so we can always come together and build the ecosystem. So thank you. I hope I've answered all the, all the questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The, the last one, and because of time, we'll, to be fair to this one, and then one, and then we'll go. Just the last, because we did this side. Just the... OK, Chris, thank you very much. I'm Brackon from Geological Engineering, um, KNUST. Oh, somebody is saying gender. So the, after you, the next yes, question will be by, from a lady. Yes, after me, yes. I think my question has been you know, partially answered. It's in line with connectivity. You know everything we're saying here has to do with connectivity. Internet. Yesterday we came here, we were asked to even assess something on the net. It was a problem. What is being put in place? What is the government doing to make internet connectivity very accessible and strong for everybody and affordable? Because now we can buy the, 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 the data and you want everybody to enjoy data. How can we buy it? So we need to, I think, uh, government should put measures in place to address these issues. These are the fundamentals. Because if you don't have a connectivity, how do you engage students? If the students cannot afford the data, how do they get on it? So let's, I, I pray we, we, we are able to resolve some of these things. Then the last question from a lady. Let me look around. Which lady? Um, this side. That will, because the ladies, oh. Just the lady and then my, my con controllers are informing me it's time and I have to obey. Um, uh, Nana, that was a very good um, um, uh, presentation. My um, question is with respect hey, to- Hey, please, your name. Uh, I am I'm Dr. Bhavna Singh. I'm from KNUST, yes. And uh, my question is with respect to the online learning certificates uh, versus the traditional learning certificates. You mentioned that they are equally uh, acceptable, but what is the state of that in Ghana? And uh, do you have any form of uh, uh, legislation body okay, okay. that accredits these uh, online courses? Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, connectivity. I think that was the question. All right, uh, when you talk about online education, we all know some of the limitations is connectivity. Connectivity has been a problem. It's not only Ghana or any other, you know, even if you go to the United States, they still have connectivity issues at some places. Good, Ghana, per the Ministry of Communication, which is uh, uh, Madame Esla, who I was very happy she gave that presentation. The Ministry of Education and the Communication, Ministry of Communication, we are working together, not only them, but to make sure the telcos also come together. Ghana is believed to be 70% connected, but the 30% deficit, we still have to come together to resolve it. And to do that, the private, the public sector, academia, industry, stakeholders, we all have to come together to fix that issue. But one technical problem in a country is we have fiber lines around in the country, 
but most of them is being introduced by NITA. Some of the fiber lines is sitting very idle. I was given a technical project to go to Amancia West to infuse some technical stuff there. When I got there, they said there's no connectivity. As a technical person, I took some SIM cards to check to make sure and other devices. When I slot any of the SIM card, I'm not going to mention the name of the provider. It was working. It's because there's not many businesses for them. They don't want to go there. So if we bring them and the government give them some sort of uh, cutbacks or some ledgers in some of their taxes and other stuff, they should drop some line, point to point access. The other part is in this country, where we have to, if somebody knows much about fiber lines, we have the single modes and the multi modes. Multi modes don't travel far, single modes travel far. But where we have to use multi modes, some places is done using single modes. That is technical. We'll look at that. So I believe when it comes to the connectivity, we can resolve it when stakeholders come together for us to see a resolution. It could be an infrastructural sharing. So if Telco, uh, maybe Airtel, reach this point, MTN can support so they can share to send, especially if it's educational content they are sending there. Legon was able to get MTN to do free sort of uh, SIM cards for them, for the students to leverage on it during COVID. So the government is talking to them to see how they can also come together to make sure connectivity is a thing of the past in the country. South Africa is 99% connected with a free SA Connect. Why not Ghana? We should be able to do that. And uh, what was the other question? Certification, good. Uh, yes, my, my doc. Uh, when it comes to the area of certification, yes, uh, GTEC, St. Laws, and of course the ministry, we are working to make sure that online education, if you receive your, your certificate online, you could also get access to certain or jobs just like somebody who did in the traditional setup. But before, what I spoke about, certain qualities or certain standards has to be met because most online education, if you do the go to for inspection, you could see that uh, some of the things they do is not really meeting the, the standards well. So now, together with the National Inspectorate Authority in the, at the ministry, they are going to come up with some checklists and some standards that will go to most of the schools to see what they are offering meet standard or the benchmarks that we have set in that policy. So it will be addressed in the policy level and we will make sure it receives the same kind of attention we are looking for. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very, 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 very much. Um, if, if I decide to continue on, we will not. Uh, uh, but the, the good thing about such conferences is that you raise the issues, and as you go out, you talk about them. And so if you finish all here, you may not get opportunity to know somebody. So talk to somebody, walk to him or her, and, and, and raise, continue to discuss the issues. Again, we also want to say that, like they were saying, the telcos and the big, big giants in the echo space, when it's these events, let them also put their monies here, and not only the beauty pageants and the things like that, because we use their devices, we use their things to learn, and so they should be able to they find a way of sponsoring some of these educational activities in, in, in Ghana. And not only they miss this, miss that. They are important, but education is equally important. So if you have friends, when you go, tell them that we say that we don't see their names in all the institutions when they are doing learning stuff. We only see their names when it is about somebody singing, raise your hand, put it on your head. Those things. It's important that we, we do all so that we'll have a better society. Once again, thank you for coming for this session. When we are done, we'll go for break. And when we come back, we go for um, the various sessions. Like we do, we have one session in the other, the room that's um, on your left and on your right and in the main room. The rooms will be pasted there for you. But like I said before, remember that at 12.50, we'll have the big discussion. It is the closing discussion. You can't miss it for anything. you get a flyer very soon and share it around the panel discussion. And that will be on generative AI language models in tertiary education, empowering student
creativity or undermining academic integrity. There are two issues. And so please, the accessibility and inclusivity will be at the syndicate room, this particular side. Quality and sustainability will be at the, on my left, in the main hall, sorry. And then quality and sustainability will be, so today we are having only two, this room and the other room. T-shirts are available, you bring, you show the receipts to them and then at the front desk you get your receipt. Those who need the tag, who don't have it yet, you can, you can get your tag here. Make a friend, talk to somebody and, and, and enjoy yourself. So we have 10 minutes snack break and we'll be back. Thank you very much.
I know you're gonna dig this. the night with another brand new song that features
You are welcome back. My name is Paul Kojo Ado, and obviously I'm not Professor Isaac Donche. He would have wished to be here, but for an equally important assignment in Accra, he's not around, so I'm deputizing for him. I am a deputy registrar of this university, and I am also a senior lecturer adjunct at the Department of Teacher Education. So I do two things at the same time. Our session is on quality and sustainability. We are going to have five presentations, so in one hour. So I'll plead with the presenters that you must try and do it within 10 minutes, so that we'll have just 10 minutes to do the discussion before we go for lunch. The first presentation we have, the impact of online counseling on mental health of distance learning students in Ghana. Anthony Kaga and Seth Kofi Ousu. Please, are you here? Yes, please come forward and get ready. You are presenting. And then we also have quality assurance in online learning assessment a systematic review of the intelligent levels in existing automatic AC scoring system. We have Stephen Adingo. Are you here, please? Please come forward and get ready. I wish if I can have all of you here in that other front row so that we can. Then the next presentation, strategies for motivating nurses to access and complete online learning in Ghana I have Juliet Kwajode. Please, I hope I got it right. Please come forward. And then we have virtual learning system in delivering quality education in colleges of education in the Vuta region of Ghana. Joseph Doche, Komla Plaha, and Mashilo Modiba. Please, are you here? Okay. And the last presentation we have e-learning and Ghana's knowledge frontiers. Charles Prempe. Charles, are you here? Charles is online. Charles will be connecting. Very good. So without much I do, Anthony and Seth, please come forward. Please let's clap for them. Please, 10 minutes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am set to, I am set confused when I'm presenting with Anthony Kanga. Mm -hmm. I have to uh, acknowledge that there is a little uh, omission with the topic. Uh, it is the impact of online counseling on the mental health of distance learning students at KN University, Ghana. So please, we acknowledge that and uh, we will rectify that. Students, Control. Students have interactions with several support services on campus, including the counseling center. And these counseling centers are on the campus. And their services they dispense for students are to resolve some of their mental health issues. And these mental health issues, if they are resolved well, brings some kind of balance and direction in the lives of these students. Now, these, counts, these centers are mostly on site, and therefore students who are on site are able to assess such services, leaving behind students who don't always come on campus to learn, especially the distance learning students. Fortunately, technology has come to change a lot of things. And 
technology has also impacted a lot of CS, including the counseling world. So several people have made several work concerning counseling and online counseling or e-counseling. And these works have only looked at on-campus students who are being able to assess online counseling, declining or leaving out the distance learning students. So the researcher seeks to investigate how distance learning students can grab such types of counseling to resolve their mental health issues. The objectives directing the study include to identify the online counseling tools used by the Care University Counseling Unit, and also the attitudes of distance learning students towards the use of online counseling at Care University, and then finally to ascertain the impact of online counseling on mental health treatment among distance learning students at Care University. At this time, my co So for the procedures and methods we used, uh, we sampled participants purposively, and then we administered our questionnaires using Google Forms. The response rate was boosted through pre-notifying participants and making, making sure that the, the survey questionnaires were short. We identified from the literature that uh, online surveys, the response rate for, for online surveys are, are sometimes weak. So these are the methods that are used to boost, boost response rates. So overall, we sampled 354 participants who are students. And then we use the positive mental health skill and the online counseling skill to gauge their perceptions about online counseling. These skills represent, of course, the, the mean value on the Likert scale. And then we use multiple regression analysis and Pearson's correlation to test the impact of the, uh, of the online counseling on the mental health of the students. So as we can see from our table, these are the procedures we used. Uh, and then also, we found out that the, the tools used by the counseling unit of KNUSD are WhatsApp, text messages, emails, and Facebook. These are the tools used by the counseling unit to administer online counseling. And so this is the, in the, in the highest order of percentage, this is the outcome of the, the response from the participants. And then we want to recommend that more higher educational institutions adopt online counseling, as of course has shown in KNUSD that students uh, um, are, uh, are leaning towards online counseling. You have a preferred uh, uh, attitude for online counseling. Counselors and mental health professionals should be informed about the practical, about the applicability and anticipated advantages of online counseling as part of interventions to promote it. We should also improve infrastructure, like video conferencing technologies, and also expand existing ones. Also train counselors to acquire basic digital literacy skills to host the online counseling sessions. Awareness creation, of course, is impossible because um, most students will, will not have known about online counseling. Yeah. So, of course, our study has some limitations. Um, if we had collected qualitative, interview, uh, qualitative responses that have had more depth to the, to the results, so we are also mindful that uh, our, sample, uh, our sample size is too small for the generalization we are making for the whole country. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anthony and Seth. Like I said, because of time, we'll let them sit down, and then we'll take all the uh, presentation, then we'll do the discussion. So if you don't mind, you can just take a seat and I'll be with you. Thank you so much. One more for them. 
we want to practice uh, inclusion. There's one participant who must attend to something very urgent, so he has pleaded to do the second presentation. And so he's also online. So Charles, are you ready? Charles is presenting on e-learning and Ghana's knowledge frontiers. If Charles, you're ready, you can make your presentation in 10 minutes. Thank you. As it were, I, I look at uh, e-learning and Ghana's knowledge frontiers, and basically, my, my argument is that the offline world is obviously not ideologically free, and that it is, it is laden or it is imbued with epistemic efforts at controlling the, the other centers of the world. And so I've structured my presentation as follows. So I'll look at the world, the fact that the world thrives on epistemic power, or what has come to be known as epistemic knowledge. Then I'll talk briefly about what I said earlier, that the online space is not value free. In other words, education itself or knowledge itself is never free from all sorts of attempt to control the other. Uh, then I'll look at what constitutes today's new colonial tendencies or imperialism, which in my case, I argue that it is nothing other than epistemic control from the other part of the world. And then I'll suggest ways of handling this kind of challenge as the world gradually moves towards uh, virtual or virtuality or cyborg, as it is now called. So to begin with, knowledge is obviously a podcast project. What it means is that uh, there is nothing free about what people do and what they write. And that since the enlightenment of the 19th century, when the Western world entered its third layer of uh, secularization with the onset of printing, the Western world succeeded in centering themselves in terms of knowledge and through that they managed to control the rest of the world. And so more recently it has come to light that colonialism uh, wasn't just a fiscal encounter as it was epistemic or knowledge encounter. And then if you look at even the enslavement of Africa, uh, which indeed preceded colonialism, uh, it came through the epistemic marginalization of African presence in the Bible. And, and more recently, one uh, scholar at the Hebrew University, Ivan Harari, has argued that the world is moving towards epistemic control and discipline, such that the, 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 any section of the world that is able to rule uh, or is able to expand ethnic frontiers, most likely will rule the world. And indeed, that has been the history ever since. So when we look at the Italian revolution of the 1970s, it resulted in the Western world metastasizing itself in terms of seeking to, to perpetuate a certain knowledge system or knowledge regime that actually began evolving since the time of Jean Paul Sartre in the 1940s and has developed up until today. And that kind of knowledge is such that it, it breeds individualism, which run roughshod over African idea of communalism or we feeling. And for this reason, the online space is not just a space for individuals to claim that they can bond. Indeed, since uh, 2000 or the turn of the millennium, they've been attempt to build online community, but that has been very difficult. And so I am more interested in how can the we Ghanaians or Africans, as it were, uh, follow James Clifford's theory of travel without traveling, where we do not, we move, but not moving physically, in the sense that we move virtually with our knowledge systems traveling around the world, and then engage with the world in such a way that we are not marginalized or peripherized. So currently, we know that the education system as we have is, is deeply entwined with the rest of the world through virtuality. And so my, my, my interest is to look at what is Ghana's philosophy of education when it comes to the online world. Uh, do we have an education that perfectly and um, creatively blend the how and the why of it? So how I'm looking at the technical aspect of education and then the why I'm looking at the philosophical aspect of education. More recently, and I, I, I stand to take questions on this or comment, uh, I have seen or observed that more of our education gestures towards the technical aspect and which, which is totally good because we need people with technical skills. And that indeed, there's, there's a precedence to that in terms of the debate between Bukati Washington and then Du Bois. I tend to sort, uh, side with Du Bois who argued that instead of 
more of technical education, as Booker T. Washington suggested, we need the African talented term. So in this case, we need the Ghanaian talented term. We need men and women who would be imbued or who would be deeply consolidated in what I call existential knowledge or existential epistem. And by existential epistem, I'm looking at the knowledge system that philosophically helps the individual to answer the question, who am I? Why am I here? And then is there life after here, which is basically um, a metaphysics. So obviously I'm looking at epistemology, knowledge creation, and that as we continuously move towards the online world, how do we reroute our, our education system in such a way that we are able to compete with the philosophies that, for example, Aristotle developed in terms of human being not being a, an animal nor a deity, but needs to be a philosopher in order to circumvent or to walk this uh, 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 complex terrain between the, individual, the sense of individualism and then also collectivism. And then we have John Dewey and then we have Foucault. These are liberal educationists or philosophers whose um, expositions have contributed to the, the individualistic world of today that is very much expressed in the online space. So going forward, what then do we need to do? And as I said, we need to go back to a bit of re-engineering or reincorporating our ancestral or uh, ancestral sagacity, which to be very particularistic here, I'm looking at the Akan, uh, which in actual fact is not just about the individual being an individual, but the individual being a composite being or a constitutive being, so that it is not just also about communalism, that in itself can be very oppressive or repressive, but a careful blend of the individual ability to be creative within the boundaries of the ethical and ontologies of the society. So this, that, this is what my, my, my presentation is about. So that I'm, I'm, I'm appealing to, to, to us educationists, academics, to think closely how in the own world today or online world today, we can have our epistemic presence felt so that we do not cry over some of the spillover effect of online, such as what I understand, the point of insult and, and, and the bastardization of means of communication or agents of communication, which I think many people do not agree with. So going forward, how do we develop our education system in such a way that individuals do not lose their sense of what they want to do in terms of creativity, but also gestures or pandas more towards inclusivity in society. So I will end here and then take comments. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You, I was just in my mind trying to remember some of the things I learned in philosophy of education. And he took me way back to philosophy of education class. Thank you so much. Because he will be hesitant very soon, he has a very important assignment to attend to. So I will allow for intervention, question, or whatever before I let him go. Yeah, you sorry, please. Uh, uh, Charles, are you with Charles? Are you with Charles? Are you with Charles? Are you with Charles? Yes, please, I'm here. Sorry. Uh, sorry. I think I'm sorry. I think you were muted, so please, I couldn't hear you. I apologize. Okay. Okay. Because 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 maybe you have to. Okay, it's better now. I'm trying to get my audience to ask a few question or intervention or respond to your presentation before I let you go. So if anybody is ready, you want to say something. Okay, so I take it that they are still processing your information and at appropriate time, even if you are not around, those of us here will try to do the discussion. Thank you so much for that presentation. We'll move to the next presentation. And God bless you. Bless you more. Quality assurance in online learning assessment. 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 A systematic review of the intelligent levels in existing automatic essay scoring system and Stephen Please let's clap for him. So, so far they've been doing it 10 minutes, so I expect you to also continue the same way. Okay, do your best.
All right, so um, we've been talking um, for the past two days about um, accessibility and equity and all this underlined by quality. So we, uh, in our work, intend to look at quality when it comes to online assessment. You would realize that um, we, even with uh, SDG 4, we are expecting that there will be long life um, education, and that expansion comes with um, the fact that there will be more stress on the existing physical infrastructure. So e-learning e e um, appears to be So e-learning appears to be the way forward. Um, but then, um, that, that means that there will be more online assessment because we cannot have learning without um, assessment. But um, sorry, OK. So in actual sense, um, we're just looking at how do we ensure quality in the assessment that we do. So we, I'm interested in natural language processing with my background, but together with myself and uh, my co-author, wanted to look at what, what is existing when it comes to assessing essays. What we have realized that for short answer, multiple choice, most of the system take care of it. But when it comes to essay writing, and the literature reveals that um, this leads a lot of online instructors to limit the assessment to just multiple choice and essay questions. But then there have been attempts, people in uh, artificial intelligence and um, computer science are trying to develop systems we call the automatic uh, essay scoring systems. So we, we, find, we set out to find out what exactly they are doing. <clears throat> so our work is grounded in artificial intelligence. Intelligence is something that is, I mean, a reserve of us humans. Um, and that accounts for why we, we have a human language. So you and I, we can communicate that set us apart from animals because of our intelligence. And so in effort to make um, computers intelligent, they will say it is artificial intelligence, not a natural intelligence. And there are a whole lot of branches. In this language processing for systems to understand language is at the heart of it is what we call a natural language processing. So that's the background. There have been some related works uh, in this, uh, the first one you see, uh, just look at historical analysis. In fact, since 1960, people have started, I mean, tried to develop such of systems. The second one is just an evaluation process, just trying to give us some tools that we can use to do this uh, evaluation. And the third one, which is similar to what we are doing, uh, is to look at the current uh, trend, except that it was limited to just 10 papers. So what is the methodology? It's simple planning what you want to do, executing it and reporting. And that is a systematic review. Um, so a three-phase recommended by Kofat Patsin is what we just adopted. And then we came out with a protocol for the systematic review. So basically, uh, you plan, execute, and report. But in between those three, uh, the activities that we undertook to ensure that we are systematically arriving at what we are looking for. So what is the review problem? We have, as I've said, the online increases is bringing stress. So like, we are going to have problems with economic risks like risk pains, posture defect. Because if you, if you give essays, you have to sit down and mark it. And if you are to mark over a thousand strips, essay of even one, one page, you can imagine. So there's a problem. How do you solve that problem? <clears throat> so we asked the question, uh, what are the existing uh, automatic essay scoring systems? 
what are the common natural language or machine learning techniques or algorithms that are available, and what are the general limitations. So we try to answer these questions. In using that, we part of our protocol is to come out with how do we search for the data. So we our keywords is to, our main keywords is this, and then we find some alternative keywords, and that will lead us to. So either you say automatic essay scoring or intelligent essay marking or computerized essay marking. And then you kind of concatenate these, um, these keywords with some Boolean um, operators so that you can search for. So we, we looked at five main uh, search engines to get that, so that's what you see in the table. Then we did an inclusion and ex exclusion criteria. What were we looking for and what are we not looking for? So the articles must be in English language, not in Chinese or any other language, even though there may be others. Um, the selected articles must be a discipline in computer science, um, and uh, even though there are others in other fields. And also must be related based on artificial intelligence so that we can measure the the, the level of intelligence we are looking for. Then the exclusion, so if you, 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 you get the articles and some may not fit, so these are the criteria we use to take those ones out. Then we extracted the data using these three stages um, because of that I will not be able to speak to all. But then we did a quality as assessment. It, the diagram tells us how our quality assessment uh, from our keywords went to the and then we filter them out using our inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then we took just articles, because there were also conference articles that make up of this. And then, so later on, we, we studied only 90, 93 of them. Now, our analysis. We use the peacock structure to fit into our questions so that we are able to see what, whether or they will capture most of the things. And that is what today. So uh, if I may use the rest of the time to report on what we found. So what are the existing automatic essay scoring? So out of the 93, these are the ratios uh, in relation to the various search engines or data uh, libraries that we, we found. Um, you realize that um, I think ACM and IEEE may be leading in that because um, those are uh, journals for computer science related and others. A yearly publication indicates that there's a rise in the publication in the area, especially from 2019 onwards, partly because of COVID. So uh, a lot of online assessment was coming, so, and there's a lot more uh, investigation into that. What are some of the existing data sets? So the popular ones are what we have listed here. The data sets are what are the characteristics of what are the various answers and exam, I mean, and, and questions or responses of students. And data set means it is in a certain structure. And what are the, 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 the various ones that we, we looked at? If you get the data, what are the things to extract from them? And so some will count just the number of words, some will count just the length of the, the sentence, and some will just look at the vocabulary, the language used, but we can put them into three. That is the style base, the statistical features, and the content relevant extracted features. Now there are some tools that will help you to do this, so we call them NLP uh, tools. So this is, these are the available tools, and uh, the proportion to which, um, if you compare it to our, our sample, the one they use most. You know. So what are the algorithms? We, we realize that they are mainly uh, neural network classification models, near base, uh, regression model, um, multi-dimensional long-term, and what have you. But all this, then we also look at the metrics. What is used to measure the success level of each of these systems? So we have the, we, we realize that most of them use the the KW, K, which is measured between zero and one. And then we have the, the PC correlation. They also have the mean absolute error. 
and the mean square error. These are the methods that they were using to do the measurement. Then we compared in order to find out how they are doing using two of the features. That is the, the bag of words and the word 2V, just two. And then we realized that majority of the machine learning algorithm could be put in neural network classification models and regression models, as you see. And these are some of the strengths and weaknesses that we found when we compare the three main models that we, we could see from the, the work that we did. So what are the, the limitations? We realized that the NLP and the neural network algorithms are more accurate than the others. The others, just using classification or regression, are just based on the number of the words, not necessarily on content, but for NLP and neural network, which is artificial intelligence related, are able to do better job accuracy. But we realize that they even still lack the ability to, the ability to be able to understand the meaning of words, even in context. So for example, a cell in, in science, in Excel, you say a cell, is different from the biologist talking about cell and the, the physicist person talking about cell. If we realize that when students write words like that, the, it confuses the system. So for example, uh, John killed Abu, and then Abu killed John. Uh, the system will not be able to distinguish between these two, who killed who, once it sees things like this. And that is because of the fact that our systems are unable to uh, understand our language in context. Then we try to look at what are the contextual, I mean, trends now by country. So you see that the U.S. is leading, followed by Indonesia. In fact, we didn't find uh, any West African except Egypt is somewhere here. So that gives us the, that we need data sets in our area uh, of speciality in our country and also uh, subject specific areas. So these are some of the future trends that we, we intend to look at or we invite people who are interested in it to look at how we can improve the algorithms and also create a database that are context based and also enhancing the extraction, the future extraction technique, which is very, very important so that you can accurately mark our results. So we went through 678 publications. Further uh, quality assurance brought us to 93. And our, with our observation for the past 10 years shows that the common features that are extracted for automatic essay scoring can be grouped into three, that is classical features, style features, and context-based. We realize that natural language, net, I mean, a neural network algorithms that is related to AI are more accurate in terms of when it comes to the ability to be able to understand meaning in, in the sentences of, of an essay. And for that matter also, then we realize that about 80% of these grading systems um, uses the Kaggle uh, ASAP data set. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephen. We'll, we'll come back to you. We'll move straight to Juliet. Strategies for motivating nurses to access and complete online learning in Ghana. Please, let's clap for her. Good morning, everyone. If not for anything, I stand here to represent gender. Since yesterday, I've been looking at um, the gender equality in the system. And I know very well that it's a very rare area for us. But we intend to convince gender to join. So my background is nursing. I started with basic nursing. I did intensive care nursing. I did a lot of work during COVID but I also did education. My passion is to bridge the gap in practice, so continuous professional education is what I stand for. Um, I am not a teacher in a school, 
I am in a practicing nurse. But I do a lot of projects, and one of the projects is what I'm coming to share with you. Um, today's, I'm coming to discuss um, strategies of motivating nurses and midwives because that's my area. You can adapt it to yours to assess and complete online learning. So for my outline, I have the introduction, I have the study design, I have the results, I have the challenges, and I have the recommendation. During the COVID, I really participated in COVID. So I understood the essence of learning in order to improve practice. Nobody had seen COVID before, but we had to work. We had to save lives. And at that moment, you had to use some of your time to learn and some of your time to practice. You learn and come and implement it so that people get better. So during that, um, we realized that <laughs> we really needed to do something in order for the nurses or the health professionals to be interested in learning whilst working. So for the opportunities we have, the nurses needed to get evidence-based practice. And because I know a lot of you read before you come to the hospital, so by the time you get there, your expectation is very high. And at that time, we can't give you that excuse that we were, we were working, so we couldn't read ahead. So we needed the time for learning to give you an evidence-based care. So I was a student at the Dickens University, and this was part of the project I needed to do um, as a digital learning professional. So that was my topic, and the method was the mixed method. So I needed to conduct a survey in addition to um, an interview. So the Quadrix was used. I'll, in my next slide, we'll talk about that a bit. And the Nursing and Midwifery platform was also used. So the Nursing and Midwifery platform has a, a place for continuous professional education for all nurses that you can assess. And in order for you to renew your license, you have to do some amount of credit points by registering online. So um, at least those people who, those respondents I got from there, the issue is that you, you, you have a confirmation that they have done at least one online course to be able to answer the questions. Um, an interview was done, um, six nurses were randomly selected, and in ethical clearance, the person should be willing to give you the information and so the six people were willing to participate in the, in the interviews. And I, have, um, I had a technical assistant because I, I was a practicing nurse and um, at a managerial level, so I didn't want anybody to feel intimidated in answering the questionnaires. Um, so these are where I got my ethical clearance from the Dickens University in Australia and then the NMC. They were supportive in the work that I did. So the data collection, we used a structured questionnaire. So we had um, a few questions we asked them. We used a structured interview, even though we were doing the interviews, just to find, fill in some potholes in the questionnaires. We had to do the interviews. And then the platform, the next and midwifery also contributed by sending out the questionnaires for me um, so that it comes directly from their quarters than from my personal quarters. So the inclusion criteria was that nurses who have participated in the online learning were selected from the database. So we had a database of nurses who had participated online. So at least um, it was okay for you to say that um, all those who participated in the, had done at least one online course. Even if you didn't complete it, once you had registered for it, um, you are a likely candidate. So this is Quadrix. Um, if you Google it, you find it. It's a research analyzing um, tool um, that can analyze your data for you. But the limitation is for those who want to um, analyze it further for um, correlation. That one, you need um, a data analyst to continue from there. But Quadrix is a very good tool for um, data analysis. Um, we have the free version, we have the um, paid version, so depending on what you want to use, but you can try it. The, there's also, um, so the um, analysis was done, we grouped them into teams because I use a like his skill at a point, so the, team, the themes were used to um, come out with the results that um, I got. So I'm interested in a bit of age, 
So we looked at the ages of people who completed the online um, survey, and the, age, the majority of age was between 31 to 40 years, and it's obviously expected. But we're also interested in those people between 51 to 60. I mean, to my surprise, I, I had people who did that. I thought they were um, after computers, so I will not get that, that range. But I, I, I was really surprised to get people who were interested in online at that age bracket. And the ranks in nurses, if you know our ranks very well, the staff nurses are new nurses. They were very much interested because they spend a lot of time on their phones. So it meant that when you have an online um, course and you, you have a lot of people in that bracket who will actually subscribe um, to, your, to your course. But we also had people in that director and deputy director's level who also were interested in doing the online courses. And some were actually on online courses, which was a, a very good, interesting um, revelation for, for the project. So let's look at some factors to discontinue or continue the online. So if you look at it um, closely, the discontinue is one. So when you look at it, one of the issues that came out very promptly was the internet. Internet is connectivity. People were talking about how much data they had to buy before they are connected to the course. Another one was looking at cost, the cost of the online courses. The online course is quite expensive, I don't lie to you. But at the end of the day, it's because we don't have locally produced courses. You have to do the online, the people who produce it are from um, outside the country, so they quote in dollar. And so when you convert it, then you see that you have a very big cost to deal with. And then another is time. Because they were nurses, they were working and they were going on to the courses. So they didn't have the time to, to do it. Even, even though the online course is at your own time, by the time they finish their strict shifts, they are tired. So they couldn't um, learn a lot on the course. Now, one other thing that came out very prominent was bulky, boring, inadequate content. Um, some of them were willing to join the courses, but they realized it was boring, so they just stopped. I mean, one of the things that um, came out was family commitment and interaction. Even though they were low, um, people had commitment in their home. So if they have to do, uh, they have to learn from their home, it's quite disruptive for them. And then interaction, they wanted the teacher to interact a bit with them. The teachers um, um, had to interact in a discussion engagement platform that um, we create normally on online. But most of these online courses were silent on that. So they couldn't ask questions even though they wanted clarity. Now, if you look at Continuum, in Continuum, they were looking at affordability, registration, and sponsorship. Um, as the minister said today, the CEO said today, um, the online courses are not sponsored. For me personally, when I started doing my course, I went to wherever I'll get sponsorship. One day, see the word online. But I was doing master's in digital learning leadership. How can I do it face to face? I will not see the tools, but they said they are not sponsoring because it's online. I went with a colleague who was doing masters in another course, but face to face, she was sponsored. Because at the end of the day, mine is online, hers is um, face to face, so she got it. But um, the issue is that we have intrinsic motivation, so we had to continue the course. Now we have personal objective. My objective was different from everybody's own, so I had to complete the course. Then they also talked about flexible timing. They are saying that they should be able to say, I want to work two times in a week just to complete my course, and it should be done. Um, the fact that I work doesn't mean that I should always do eight to five, a very strict shift. That's what they were talking about. One thing that also came out very prominent was simple, engaging contact, uh, content. They wanted to engage, and they wanted something that is simple. So if it is a simple, engaging content, they will be able to join it. I mean, if it's engaging and simple, obviously, when you sit in it for like um, 20 to 30 minutes, one hour, you'll be able to engage. So that was what they were talking about. And then a stable internet. As for the calm environment, people talked about it, but it wasn't really coming out well. Another thing was certification. It ran through a lot of people's comments and during the interview that they wanted certification that is authentic so that when they go through the course, they will be able to show a certificate for it. So these are some of the challenges during the interview. So the challenges came out as time constraints, which was also in the survey. Access to network was another thing they spoke about. And the access to network was because some of them hooked onto networks that were not reliable. So um, they needed to buy bigger gigs and do other things like MiFi, Wi-Fi. Most of them were using just their phone data, which were not 
like 10 CDs, 5 CDs, that's what they were used to. But once you want to do online education, you have to be able to plan for internet service. And then we also have type of device that they were using. So some of them, their devices were not um, friendly to the platforms. So um, I'm sorry to say, when you have to buy a device that you really want to do online learning, there are certain devices that are quite universal. And so if you buy those ones, you'll be able to hook on to courses. And then we also had cost of the course. Most of them were doing courses in UK, US, and all that. That is what you can get. And you can't get a course that is based in Ghana. So once it is that, you have to be ready to pay the dollar rate. And then we also had a um, bad learning experience. As for this one, I actually dwell on it a bit because I am a testimony of supporting from a course. And um, when I went on to the course, um, at that time, COVID was on the rise. I mean, that was a peak of COVID, 2020. That is when I actually hooked on to the course. And I had to do a back-to-back -back shift. A back-to-back -back shift means that I do like three days in the hospital without getting home. And it means that we had a lot of patients who we had to save their lives. But I got to a point, I, I really gave up on the course because I didn't have the time. I was tired mentally, everything. Because um, you go to work and you go do all this stress, and then you come back, you have to come and sit behind your PC. And Australia timing is like Ghana midnight. So you have to actually try as much as possible to meet. But my teacher, my, my, my teacher, reached out to me and was like, no, um, I know you guys from Africa, you're like only two or three in the class, but you don't come for class. And it's true, I didn't, I didn't go because I was tired. And then she had to do the supporting. So she sends me materials, backdoor, emails. Whenever you send her an email, she's ready to give you a response. She's ready to give you alternatives. And so this support system was very helpful to me personally. And so because of that, the students' discussion um, platform was very active because we could express what we are feeling. I wasn't the only one doing COVID. A lot of people were doing it. So if they are not able to come, we could reschedule the class just to satisfy a few people who hadn't entered the class for like three times. And so this support is very, very important. Now, recommendation. Um, use online learning to prepare nurses and midwives for the next generation is very important. There are certain courses that you cannot get face to face. I mean, it, it's just, I, I'll not say a waste of time, but it will, it, it will be time um, preservation if you do it online. And let them have their work time, and then they can also learn that. And then provision of accreditation for online courses. That is quite difficult. People have it, but we don't. So for me personally, if I have to generate an online course, I don't even know for starters where to go to get the accreditation in the first place. So because of that, I'll do it. When accreditation system come, I'll go for accreditation. Um, provide culturally friendly content. That is what I've spoken about. Provide scholarship for students who pursue online learning. And then educators should provide discussion community. The last one is about policy and stakeholder engagement for use of effective resources. There are so many of them that collaborate. In my school like this, I happen to get into a virtual simulation or reality um, and simulation lab that was for um, the pilots. They had done a virtual simulation so you can get into it and behave like a pilot and move a plane. Um, the medicals too had the same thing. We call it virtual reality. They also had something like that. And so we had examples, fiscal examples of the things we can do online as in labs. If you want to create a lab, this is how you do it. So we, because of stakeholder engagement and all that, we were able to do those things. So stakeholder engagement and policy is very, very important at this point. So what is the next step? The next step is that um, if you see this link I have put there on my, on my, on my left, it is talking about Africosity. Africosity is a um, an African-generated, a Ghanaian-generated learning management platform, um, which is private. So because I was looking for a learning management platform in Ghana, I had to chance on them. And um, I've been doing some work with them, so very soon I'll blast it, and then people will hook onto my online course. The next one is gamifying the learning. So I used um, Kahoot to teach the nurses I had in my place. So whenever I have to do any training, um, I put in that so that they are able to um, use it and go along with it. At the end of the day, I get my feedback. I get the impact of what I want to teach them. They are able to correct their actions, and then we move on. So this is what you can do. You can take 
your phone and hook on to www.kahoot.it. I have just a short evaluation on my platform for you to press it and play. So you can do that and then you can also try it and see on your phone. Um, it's just one minute thing, but if it is not going well with you, um, Again, yeah, the game pin will come very soon, so he has to activate it for you. Put in the game pin. Please press start. Yeah, so the game pin is coming. You can, you can see the game pin on the screen. It will come right now. You can put it in there. Yeah, so 7267460 is a game pin. So at least if one person enters the game, I will, I will stop playing. Okay, so start it. Anybody who wants to join could join, but you can start it. So I put my quizzes in there and they are able to enter and I see them and then we are, we are able to go with that. And kindly start. At least we have a, a whole lot of people there can start. All right. Okay, so that's a true or false question. It's on your phone, you can click it from there. Health professionals need online learning. So the true is the blue color, the uh, false is the red color. So whichever one you want to click, you can put it on it. So I have 24 blues, one, um, one uh, false. Please let's go to next. No, next at the top, next at the top. Yeah, uh-huh. So this is a pool. All right, so online learning helps professionals to maintain their competency and skill. You can agree, you can disagree, whatever you want to choose, you can choose it on your phone and we'll see it here. All right, press, press next at the top, please. It's only three questions, it's the last one. So share a word to describe online learning. You can choose from here, any of them. So the winner is the one who pressed with time and correctly. And I think I'll give you an award for pressing on time. All right, so um, I have 25 people for force. Okay, you learn it. So press next. Okay, so um, Ade, Ade was the one who won for me, please. Thank you very much. I have Chris here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So please, who is the first person? Crazy. Anybody you think crazy? You have done well. I mean, so this is the first. Three people, Kwesi, Chris, and Ade. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please, let's do it for her one more time. We have the very last one. Joseph, are you around? Do we have Joseph? Or is Joseph online? Control room, is Joseph online? Okay. If we don't have Joseph online, I will try as much as what we are done. Okay, thank you. So we've listened to four wonderful presentations. Uh, Seth and Anthony uh, took us through the impact of online counseling and mental health, and I must say, and disclose that I work at the Directorate of Student Affairs, so I have my counselors 
The key message from it is that the quality of support we give to learners is so important. That is what I picked from their presentation. And they encourage us to adopt e-counseling services. And our directorate of student affairs, we have a counselor dedicated for distance learning. It's called Mr. Jawu. And then uh, Charles' presentation, like I said, philosophy of education, and he questioned three things, or he brought in four three things. The method of, uh, the method we use to disseminate information, the validity of it, and then the scope of it. And he called for alignment of knowledge to what we want to present to our learners using the e-learning platform. And he said, ancestral way of doing it, ancient way of doing it, we must make sure the purpose of education in current times aligns to the previous time if the purpose is that good. So we have to focus on that. And then Stephen also came in integrity in assessment. And then he also made us understand that machines are able to support us to create. And using algorithm and other methods, we have to consciously adopt such uh, methods as we move forward. Because of the numbers that are coming up, he gave us three things that we should look at for when we are looking for a system to create ACEs. And so if we are doing it manually and we are struggling, there are mechanisms, and we, he encouraged us to look for more research in these areas because the best one will always support us to achieve the best for our students. And then Juliet also came in motivating nurses, and not just nurses, all of us to learn. And from her presentation, I picked quality of the learner, the, the health status of the learner. We have to put the learner in context, the support that we provide for the learner, so far as sustainability is concerned. She also talked about emotional support, and she ended by saying, can we provide uh, this uh, learning experience in a form of a game so that uh, a group like nurses who are stressed out in the hospitals, they can learn using the e-learning, but they can also have fun, and she demonstrated it with the Kahoot. So thank you. These are things that I pick. I don't want to say everything. I wrote, I wrote a lot of things, but I want you to also speak. So I'll open it up for 10 minutes. Questions, interactions, anything you want to add, subtract, please let's do it in 10 minutes and we are out of here. The floor is open. Thank you. I recognize you, so I'll take your, and feel free to ask any of my presenters. Thank you. I only wish to congratulate them for the work that they have done. Now, what I will put in will be a form of suggestion as to what to do in terms of creating relevant <coughs> content for pre-tertiary and tertiary education. Now, I wish to stress that Communication is key to developing any well-written and authentic research material that excites the interests of learners and engage them. And so if we are to communicate, what I find in the traditional model has always been verbals and highly technical expressions used in books. Maybe the idea has been to kind of show one's level of uh, academic or yeah, one's level or status in academia or whatever, but it misses the point in communication. And like my uh, other researcher stated earlier, once a material does not communicate and make meaningful construction to the learner, the learner will be pissed off automatically. Now, what we use as authors and publishers, there are standards and criteria we use. You come to NACA, that's the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment. They have standards, one of which will tell you about the font that you use. 
from where I am sitting, I can look at the fonts KNUSD has used to kind of design the poster and we'll give them thumb up because the font are legible and they don't shout. But this same font cannot be used for primary schools. So whatever you are packaging out there, we have to make sure that they follow professional standards. The font should be classic. We should make sure we have cultural inclusivity. We have disability-friendly materials, which has already been spoken about. And the cultural relevance here is important. I think there is no lesson uh, under the sun that cannot be brought down to the level of whoever you want to communicate to and for what intended purpose. So in, so some, in, 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 in share, because of time in summary. Yeah. In a nutshell, mm -hmm. all that I will say is that for us to create a catchy content for our students, we should be mindful of construction. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take the next. Yes, sir. Thank you. Please, if you can put your microphone off for me, the last speaker. Thank you so much. Yep, on. Yeah, it's on. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, mine is on the mental counseling, the distance counseling. I think seeing the, the client or the one you're talking to is very important in counseling. And this one, we are doing a distance. How are you able to provide an effective counseling while well, you're not seeing the mannerism, the one you're talking to? Because that can determine the, the line of talking, questioning. If you see how the person is responding and you are not seeing the person, how? effective then or have you addressed that aspect thank you okay i'll let them respond quickly and then you can sit there just press the microphone i i, I think that one of the ways of addressing that is using the uh, video conferencing technologies so like zoom like this you can do a video chat with your client or the student where you see his mannerisms and all that so it's very important to use video conferencing technologies. It's very important to use video conferencing technologies. And also, if you are talking about uh, mannerisms, uh, and some of the times you, you see that uh, you can gauge the, the, the clients, um, what, how do I say, you can gauge the clients' perceptions or the, the clients' um, problems through whatever expressions, through some of the things that he sends you. So for WhatsApp like this, you can advise the client to use emojis. So emoticons can also help you to gauge some of the, the, the feelings of the client. So what we are doing is to bridge the gap. So as much as possible, we try to leverage on the technology to, to, to bridge that gap. Even when there is a gap, you try to use some of the tools that the technology gives you to bridge the gap. So what we can say is that our counselors should abreast themselves with some of the nitty gritties of the technology so that they can use it. It wouldn't be that effective, but at least it will help. Thank you. Thank you so much. And from my experience, like I said, Directorate of Student Affairs, to surprise you that some of my clients will come to our office in the dark around 7, 8, sometimes 9 p.m. That is the time some of them are coming because they don't want anybody to see them. So sometimes even that space also provide opportunity for people because they don't, I don't want you to see me, but I want us to interact and get to know who I am and my idea. So sometimes it's not wholly true that you, you, they, they want you to see them. And KNUSC, I'm telling you, so I'm, most of us in the art office will leave after 9 p.m. Even Saturday, pass through the office, and you are likely to see students waiting to talk to somebody quietly. And so things are changing. Thank you. I'll take the last one, and then we, sure, take it away. Thank you very, hello. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, my colleague researchers that presented here, I, I, I want to, appreciate everyone here with the very good work that they have done. But I want to encourage, I want to encourage that uh, in doing our research works, let's try as much as possible to review our literatures very, very well. Because some 
sometimes you may present a study and somebody might have also done a study in let's say in 2022 or in 2023 and you are basing your study on let's say a literature that was uh, done on somewhere let's say 2015 it will the, the the problem that comes with that is that it will uh, take away the new or updated trend at which your study should be able to build on. Because if you bring us a study, for example, yesterday, uh, the flip technology that we were discussing, uh, I, the, I, I realized was proposed somewhere in 2012. And I think at the moment, there should be a flip technology which has been also updated on somewhere let's say 2022 even though i have not cited one yet okay but you have if you have done a proper literature review i think you might have cited an updated one which may be 2018 2019 or even 2023 and well noted with the united states of america that they are into technology very well that it keeps on bringing in new ones that we should be mindful of our literature review in doing our studies. Thank, thank you very so very much. much. And I want to thank everybody. We've looked at quality and sustainability. And please, as we move from here, whatever we have learned, let's apply it. Thank you so much. Oh, you didn't clap for me. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Bhavna Singh, and I will be moderating the post-plenary session. So you've been to two different rooms and uh, you've, have, you've had several presentations, two in Dale's room and four in Paul's room. So uh, we've all joined Paul back uh, whilst he was still uh, going through his session. So I'll request Dale to also give us a, a brief overview of what happened in uh, his room. Thank you. Hello everyone, we were talking about accessibility and inclusion. And I use the analogy that accessibility is welcoming someone into your home and inclusion is making them feel like they're part of the family. So we had two sessions talking about how KNUST and other professors are using technology to do that. First, helping more students come into the university and second, including them in the learning process. Uh, the first was on the challenge of French instruction and teaching language online. And the professor described the study of different tools and techniques that were used to support French learning and the advantages and disadvantages. I especially appreciated the analysis of the student perspective that she presented because it brought in all of the voices of the students around this challenge. And surprisingly, uh, for me, for example, the access to a device was not as big a challenge as some of the other uh, issues that they raised. So students may have a piece of technology like a computer or a cell phone, but then they encounter other problems during the learning process. So I think we're getting to a point where we have more confidence in accessibility. Inclusion is a challenge that our second presenter was talking about as well. And in his study, he was looking at Zoom and how do you find a way to encourage the students to interact on these online platforms. We all know the challenges we face as professors when we're trying to communicate and connect with our students. So the, the ultimate goal is to find new techniques and new technology to incorporate that learning process. Uh, it is going to be an ongoing challenge for a long time. As I see it, this is the new frontier. Accessibility and inclusion are the first two steps in the process. Quality and sustainability are the second two steps. So let's help our, our students come into our home here at KNUST and the other universities and let's make them feel part of our family once they're here. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. 
So I open the floor for all of us to um, uh, bring out their suggestions, their questions, their recommendations based on the uh, various presentations we have had. I know we were not all in both rooms, but we have read the abstract from each author. So uh, the floor is open to all of us. Thank you. All right, looks like no one is ready to uh, begin. So can we go um, maybe one author by the second author? So we will start with uh, the, the topic that Dale presented. Um, digitalization, digitalization, digitalizing the French language classroom in Ghana for sustainable development, policies and perspective. Does anyone have any questions regarding the presenter, regarding the, the, the objective of the study, the methodology used, the key outcomes, the recommendations. Do we have any question for the author, Stella? Please, I believe you've all read through the abstracts and some of us have also got, heard the, the presentation. Do we have any questions for the author, Stella? All right, what about the second presentation, which was on Zoom generation, a steering student experience with digital learning. That was presented by Albert, a very interesting one. That uh, brought us, uh, gave, gave us a good knowledge about inclusivity in e-learning. Well, any anyone in the audience? Well, I was there, and then I want to add. I think we did some addition, and then because it was an ongoing research, what we find out was that the ladies wanted to know whether it was gender bias, so they also want that inclusion. But at that time, it wasn't still there, so we wanted them to add and then build up on it. And the next one was that um, with Zoom connectivity and challenges that it has, it probably will be sponsor specific. Well, you know, iPhones could connect a little bit better and they will get better outcome than somebody using Infinix, blah, blah. So we also want the researcher to do an update where he could include, because they will not include that in there, so that we could have a, a varied, and then just like the marketer also said, so that we could publish it out there, so that in every more like institution, if it's very clear you're using, you know that um, these phones are better dealt with in this um, app. So that is kind of inclusion I want to add. Thank you. Thank you. And Albert, do you have anything to say about that? Yes, I think we accepted it in good faith. Yes. Um, the challenge is that the, the submissions are still ongoing, so uh, we will reflect on it as a team and then decide what to do. Thank you. Do you have any key message to give regarding the, your outcomes? Oh, I think we, what we shared was um, preliminary findings of and ongoing studies and generally uh, students or participants had positive experiences with Zoom uh, but of course there were challenges um, regarding distractions, regarding internet connectivity, uh, sometimes difficulty to follow lectures but the experience was generally positive. Thank you. Thank you Albert. So you're adding more knowledge to the e-learning, um, yes. Uh, challenges in Ghana. Yes, with respect to quality and sustainability group, um, I would like to, yes, start with the topic given by our lady. I'm also very passionate about that. Strategies for motivating nurses to access and complete online learning in Ghana. I'm sure we all have a lot of questions with respect to that topic. So anyone in the audience, questions for Juliet? Yes, please to find out um, okay and um, thanks for the opportunity um, before COVID came we had issues of if you do online courses um, the institution would not accept and upgrade your certificate because you didn't go for face-to-face -face, um, lectures I would want to find out from her after her um, completion was her certificate um, accepted by NM or wherever institution she is did they upgrade her? Is this something, is this still a challenge in our clinical area? Yes. Because it is something that is still, I don't know whether it's still um, 
happening or is, they've changed because of this new trend of e-learning. Thank you. Thank you. Juliet, over to you. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, the certificate is uh, still a challenge. For me, um, I had to present it to the Nursing and Midwifery Council. And because it's new, you know very well that I have to create my own part. I mean, I don't know who else has what I have. And um, I'm just trying to find out who else has that. Um, so that but internationally, professionally, we have a body that one, um, I have comfortably um, um, enrolled in that. But for Ghana, I am yet to find where to create my niche. So yes, it's a challenge, but um, I think I'm up to the challenge. So we'll continue to um, fight the battle. Thank you. Thanks, Juliet. Anyone else? Any questions for Juliet? There's a question here. Yes, please. Please go ahead. I, I think we can, uh, you can start with you. Yes. <laughs> Okay, um, looking at uh, Dave's presentation yesterday, Bloom's taxonomy has been used worldwide to assess quality learning in the classroom. And one of the areas that we have been looking at is to focus on creation. That's powerful learning happens when students and learners are able to create on the basis of the knowledge received, a solution to an existing problem. How are you going to assess your students or modify your pedagogy to be responsive to the critical minds and creativity of students in Ghana? Thank you. Juliet. Um, I, I told you my background is nursing, so I use them as my, my model. Um, so I try most of the things I want to do in my organization because we are a bit digitally inclined. Um, and so for my presentations and my trainings, I have modified it in such a way that it is more um, collaborative and then um, case presentations. So that's what I do with them so that they can get the insights of the problems and how we can solve it. So for um, group work, you see online, you can do group, um, group work online. So anytime I have a training, the group work is very good for the students because they are more engaged. And I told you the games are in there so that you, you still maintain their attention throughout the presentation you are doing. And I'm mindful of the, the fact that the human mind also has a maximum engagement online of two hours. So if you are doing any training whatsoever and it's more than two hours, trust me, the, the learners are not engaged. So if you want to do it in bits, that is fine. So because I have these backgrounds, whenever I have to do trainings, they are, they are, um, some of these things are considered so that the training come out. Now for my assessment, um, some of them are practically assessed and they are virtual realities for that. I have not created a virtual reality, but I have access to a platform that could give them that. So um, in my assessment, it's one of the things you are going to do and present to me. That's what I'm saying that um, I have discovered um, the Africosity platform, which is a learning management platform in Accra. And I am working with them because I want to blast one of my courses to see how people would accept it and how they will be engaged because of my background as a student engagement and what the effect is on the learner, um, I want to implement that to see how it's going to work. I know the traditional system is not used to that. You can't take your phone and call your teacher and tell your teacher that you are, you are stressed. You can't do that. But somewhere else, it is possible. You can just send an email and the response is very quick. You can engage your teacher. I don't understand this. And the teacher will find time and do the explanation for you. So that, those are the kind of things that I want to engage. And that relaxes the student's mind. And you are able to give off your best and create. Because you need to create something. M mine is not here. Yeah, it's problem solving. But there should be an amount of creation. I don't want it to be a straight jacket where um, when the solution is off, the one we have discussed is not there and you are found in the situation, you can't solve the problem again. No, you should get alternatives to solve it. 
I think I've tried to answer your question. I've tried. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if I still have the chance, yes. I will say I'm much particular about you because a lot of traditional problems center around your profession with regards to birth. And you look around us in Ghana, we have remote places where people hardly have access to midwives. Now, we live in Ghana where we have uh, nurses in the city, but most of whom work around unprofessional ethics, disrespecting, and so on and so forth. So in your lessons, this e-learning platform is critical to addressing some of these challenges. I wish to state once again that do you pose questions problem-based questions before lessons begin. That will force the learners to explore alternative means of solving and bring out values, the values we traditionally had that are getting lost. Are we going to inculcate all these to making sure that critical thinking and problem solving are part of the, the gaming uh, examples you give? And to tell you, the gaming, according to NACA once again, is 20%. All that you did, what is, what is, what is? Now, under the new curriculum, we are marking a 20%. Now they say creativity and innovation is 60%. So this is where I want you to elicit more examples and clarify ideas which when implemented will ensure that the new generation of Ghanaian nurses are well equipped, equipped critically and mentally to address the challenges confronting us as people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and now, please, just give me one minute. Okay. You see, um, this was a conference, so I just needed to do something quick on your gaming. But in natural fact, um, the thing that I use is not what is. Because at the end of the day, I just need simple things for because they are not nurses. I mean, so I just need to use simple things, but I get your point. So I told you in the beginning, my passion is to bridge the problems in the practice. And so as part of the things, me, I did quality, seriously, I did quality in healthcare. So at the end of the day, there are issues on quality and professionalism and patient safety is what I am going to deal with. So don't worry, you'll be rest assured. Thank you, Juliet. So we'll leave some of the questions from the audience for Juliet during the lunch break. <laughs> Yes. Yes, we had one more person from the audience. Yes. Thank you. Well done, Juliet. Um, I, I wanted to ask concerning the virtual reality. Um, you mentioned in your presentation about a lab work that you let your students do. And I was very concerned about that. How effective was that when you um, carried that out? I'm sorry, I, I didn't carry it out. I participated in it. You're okay, you actually participated yes, in it. I okay. all participated in it. So, so in, your, in, your, in your view, how effective would you say that is? Because um, that, 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 that is much of my concern. Because I'm in art education, and where we have to, as educationists, we have to teach um, our students some practical um, things. And um, if we have to go virtual, and we are doing practical, we could, I know we could do videos, but how effective can that go? That was my concern. I thought probably um, you may have an idea of how if effectively it has been done elsewhere or how effectively it could be done. Okay, so the feedback I have from other places is that it's effective. But the one I participated in it was very effective because it was a problem challenge. I mean, it was a problem challenge in the virtual reality. So you enter there to solve a problem. So that is, but it was a practical thing. So if they said the patient is collapsing, what are you supposed to do? You are supposed to do it with the entry of the thing. That, that's the practical side of the thing. We're able to finish it by timing because um, the thing was given with time limit. So once you're not able to finish, because you're supposed to resuscitate somebody in five minutes. And in the real world, if I'm standing here and I'm doing it, if the, it is five minutes, Stop, stop, stop. But that place, if it's five minutes, it's off. 
it means that you are you are not able to resuscitate the person in that five minutes that's what it means you have to come back and do it well and make sure that you have the skill to do it in that five minutes the issue with the face-to-face -face was that i can pardon you because we are doing face-to-face -face. but at that point it was so disheartening because i couldn't resuscitate my patients i felt so sad but at the end of the day, I had to do two or three times in order for me to be able to get my timing right. But I had the things to work with. And so for effectiveness, yes. But when I see my patient on the thing, you have to go back to your patient and see whether your five minutes can work. Because you have done it in five minutes. So I'm hoping that when you come and see your patient, you can still do it in five minutes. I know it's a platform. It's, it's, it's an app. It's, 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 it's a platform. So people are not really used to it but when you enter in there you see that you have entered a room where there's a patient struggling and you have to do it all right thank you julia thank you so much even though we have one last presentation that was done by uh, steven uh i don't think we have time so steven will take uh, will give you all the questions during the lunch time thank you so much thank you Thank you very much. When it is getting sweet, time is also running out. Uh, so that's, that's the term. Our next presentation will be online by S Sailor Academy. And it will be presented by Cherise Gardner and Jacqueline Arnold, Sailor Academy US. So we'll put the lights off and then we'll have their presentation via Zoom. So that's all. So thank you very much. One, please respond. Let me uh, take this. We can down. hear you. I, I appear to be. It looks like you're on. Yes, we can hear you. So you can share your screen and then present. I think you've muted it now. Okay, it's, it's back. It's back. Okay, thank you. While you're getting that ready, Sharice, uh, should I get started with our... Please, uh, please do. Please do. Thank you. Um, greetings, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Arnold. I'm the Director of Strategic Relationships at Sailor Academy. Um, we're really honored to be included in the e-learning Ghana conference today. Um, I'm going to do uh, just a very quick introduction of... Uh, Sailor, the Sailor Academy platform and how we'd really hope to be able to um, collaborate with KNUST. Um, and then I'm going to hand the presentation over to my colleague, uh, Sharice Gardner, who's the manager of our OER Accelerator and a part of the strategic relationships um, team um, and a huge part of our outreach. Um, Sharice, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Um, and Sharice will handle the majority of this presentation, but I just wanted to open up to say um, Sailor Academy is an education focused nonprofit. Um, and we work with a lot of universities around the world uh, to support their skill development efforts. Um, we do that through our free platform of online and on demand courses. Um, Sharice is going to get into the detail, but those courses include um, practical elements such as practice, um, knowledge checks, and other supports. Um, and we have a full library of courses um, that our university partners use to support portfolio development among their students and staff. Um, so I hope that you'll get a lot of, out of this presentation. Do feel free to ask us um, questions. And Sharice is going to take over and get into, introduce herself and get into further de um, detail about the platform. Thank you so much for having us with you today. Thank you, Jackie. And greetings, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. As Jackie said, Sailor Academy uh, provides uh, many resources to our partners to help them 
with their skill development uh, program. Uh, and so I'm going to show you a little bit about our courses and uh, our platform. First of all, we would begin with uh, the experts. We uh, hire teaching faculty and uh, credentialed experts in fields in business and technology uh, to work with us to build the course blueprint, what this course will be about. They tell us when a student comes to a course of a certain title, what they expect to be in that course and what they should learn upon the completion of that course. And so we begin with the outline. Once we're uh, uh, working together with someone, we ask them to help us uh, vet, find, uh, review, and even create um, open educational resources uh, that can be used to uh, in the course that align to the learning outcomes as detailed in the blueprint, both at the course and the unit level. And finally, we are base our course development and de design and development on solid pedagogy, following the best practices in e-learning. Uh, we follow recommendations by such groups as Quality Matters, which uh, provides practitioners, our, uh, people like us, with um, uh, research-based strategies and best practices. We also build our courses on the foundation of Bloom's learning taxonomies, and other expert uh, guidelines, such as Vanderbilt University's Guide for Assessment Writing, to be sure that we are writing concise and, and accountable uh, tools of assessment, for, accountable by both the student and ourselves, to be sure that we are clear, consistent, and, and comprehensive. So, uh, to reiterate, our quality is built not just on the course design, but in the very course development process, beginning with the experts, who we then team with our internal internal instructional design and educational technology uh, staff to uh, build courses aligned to the outcomes. And then we again use uh, credentialed faculty and experts to review our courses on a regular cycle, as well as during production. So I wanna give you uh, the outcome. Every course that we build looks like any course you would expect to find online or even in the classroom. Uh, you begin with a syllabus with the course overview and description. The course uh, content is broken down into units and they have their individual outcomes and uh, their tips for success. The materials that we uh, include can be readings, videos, interactive exercises and activities. Again, all aligned to the learning outcomes. Also, we include such a thing as knowledge checks and these are opportunities for the student to stop in in the middle of the uh, uh, unit or along somewhere in the unit a couple of times to reflect on what they've learned so far we'll ask them review questions give them a case or scenario uh, and they can uh, determine for themselves uh, how well they have grasped the, con the concepts because these are self-paced self-facilitated courses and then finally, we have the assessments. The formative assessments are the unit quizzes. Each unit ends with a quiz. This is an ungraded event, again, for the student's benefit. The quiz will give students uh, uh, feedback for incorrect answers that lead them to the specific spot in the course where the concept that's being quizzed, uh, where they can go and review that concept. So this, again, is not graded. It's for the student to take uh, so that they know whether or not they are ready to move on to the next unit. And they may take these quizzes as many times as they want. Uh, we have a robust quiz bank, so they'll get a different one. Um, and then finally, there is a seminal assessment, the, the summative assessment, which is the final exam. This one will not give a student feedback, but it will let the student know which questions they got wrong so that they can review the course or those concepts. Students must pass this course uh, at 70% to be successful. So they must receive at least a grade of 70%. So again, our courses are responsive so that they can be used on your laptops and mobile devices, but we also have an app. 
And we design our course content so that it's readily downloadable for use offline. This is another barrier to uh, access that we are hoping we work to overcome because we know that data is expensive. So all of our course materials are built within the course. A student need not link out for anything in addition to the to what was there and that it can be downloaded. So let me jump out of my slides here and I want to show you uh, the uh, courses that we're talking about. We offer uh, courses in professional development. And as you can see, we have many uh, uh, titles and, and courses on your basic office skills that, you, that employers like to see uh, walking in the door for a new employee. But also we have uh, resume writing and interviewing skills to help uh, uh, those who are looking to enter the workforce develop the kinds of skills to help them be successful in their pursuits. And we also have courses of higher level uh, uh, skills that anyone would need throughout the course of their entire career to nurture and build their skill sets, uh, such as introduction to management, decision making, uh, leadership in teams, managing employees, resource, human resource management, and many, many more. Another area that is a uh, subject area popular with our uh, our partners are business administration, and this appeals to the entrepreneurial set. So this again is another subcategory of our of our catalog, and we have many 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 courses here again that uh, uh, you know people who want to start a business well can acquire knowledge and skills as well as those who already have a business can acquire knowledge and skills to grow and 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 thrive. I don't need to tell you how important and popular computer science is. And we have many uh, computing courses that students can take. Python, C++, our newest course uh, in, in the, um, on the menu is uh, R programming, an open source uh, of programming. So again, we have a very robust uh, 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 schedule of courses here. And we have additionally this set, uh, series of five courses which is uh, designed to help anyone who has uh, uh, English as a second language or your know, basic language skills to uh, uh, develop skills uh, to the uh, academic and business proficiency level. So the, again, this one is very popular with our partners. Let me go back to my slides. So I have uh, submitted a, a, a brief video where our, my colleague Jackie is presenting a course tour. I believe that the uh, conference coordinators would prefer to play that from their end, or would you have me play it from here? Is the control room there? You're muted. Okay. So it's being played. And then, dashboard. And please, audience, so get to questions. I already have an account at um, Sailor Academy that I'm using for tour purposes. And so we have a very easy login procedure. Um, students can either create a username and password, or they can use um, Google or Facebook as a single authentication experience. The course I'm going to tour today is our Business 402 course and a free certificate of accomplishment through taking a certificate exam. And I'll show you where these exams live in momentarily. To navigate the course, you can use the sidebar menu as I've done, as I'm doing now. Or you can also navigate through the top uh, breadcrumb menu. Uh, you'll notice within um, Sailor Academy's courses, uh, we've really constructed the courses to emulate what a student would find in an online or even in an in-person course. Um, so you'll see very familiar elements such as a course syllabus. You'll see that the courses are broken down by unit so the students can study in units. Um, all of the materials, the reading materials, um, any lecture videos, uh, quizzes, and other activities that a student would need 
are all included within the course. And I'll expand the unit one so that you can see um, the contents uh, that I'm referring to. So here you'll see the different types of content that we provide. And depending upon the course, the mix between text and video may change. Um, however, we always include a lot of reading to make sure that students really do have mastery of the concepts and they're prepared for whatever that next level of study would be. So whether that's project management two or management systems, um, a student finishing um, this project management course would be well prepared um, in their next level of study. Another way that students can navigate through courses, and I'm just going to click these elements as complete so that I can show this bookmarking feature that we have. is that we have a course progress bar on the side and you can see I marked two elements as complete and now they change from blue to green. So say I'm a student and I've had to take a couple of days away from the course to attend to other priorities and I needed to know where I need to pick up um, on my studies. I can um, look at this course progress bar. I've noticed that these two are marked complete so I'm going to go to the next element. And then I can continue on with my studies. So we offer um, a variety of student supports for students to make sure that they're successful um, in their final exams. One of those is a study guide. And I wanted to show the study guide for project management because as you can see, it's a very comprehensive study guide. Um, it doesn't replace taking the course itself, of course. Um, but we want to make sure that students know um, some elements that they can focus on to make sure um, that they're going to be successful as they uh, get ready for their exams. And to start, I'd like to show you the login process as well as our student dashboard. So I already have an account at um, Sailor Academy that I'm using for tour purposes. And so we have a very easy login procedure. Um, students can either create a username and password or they can use um, Google or Facebook as a single authentication experience. Great, thank you, Jackie. And so as she mentioned, there is a final exam, and this exam uh, it can be taken three times. A uh, student must score at least 70. We recommend two weeks between each attempt so that uh, the student has a chance to study the, the concepts that they need to review and take the course. Uh, if after three attempts, the student has not passed the course, uh, they may take it again because there's no harm, no foul, no tuition has been lost, and no deadlines have been mess, met. Missed. The uh, courses are again uh, free to access at any time and are uh, um, untimed. You start when you when you want to finish when you can. Upon successful completion of the course, this is a certificate that you receive. Here's a model of a set of a certificate that we issue. And of the features among the certificate is that you can uh, 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 share it. Uh, it's a digital certificate. Of course, you may print it and frame it if you're very proud of yourself. I, I, we, I have seen that. But many people also share them on social media, such as Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and that these are shareable anywhere. Uh, the certificates are verifiable. Uh, who are academics or uh, employers who receive the certificate um, can, uh, there's a button they can click and, and, and our system will verify it for them so that they can't be faked. Uh, but employees can build uh, learning portfolios and, and, and put many certificates in their portfolios or students can build uh, their own learning portfolios to put in their profile. Uh, many of our, our certificate holders are very proud of themselves and, and we see them all over social media posting their achievement. Okay. Let me go back to my slides. So again, Sailor Academy seeks to disrupt uh, 
the barriers, as many barriers as we can from where we sit uh, to access to educational opportunities. Uh, we disrupt the barrier of cost. We're free not only to the students, but also partnering with uh, Sailor Academy comes at absolutely no cost to the partnering institution. So we would love an opportunity to speak with any of you uh, representing your universities. We ask that your decision makers reach out to us, your vice chancellors, DE directors, or registrars reach out to us and let's have a chat. We'd love to sit down with you and see if we can help you meet your program goals for professional development offerings to your students or to your communities at large. Again, these are free courses. So this provides you with opportunities to engage with the community uh, within which you reside. Uh, we sit down and see if we can come up with course alignments that would help you and your students. Uh, and, and if we decide to proceed, we'll give you an information packet to fill out in which you uh, select this list of courses, any and all of our courses uh, for your menu. And uh, if you, when you sign the MOU, we will receive your information, your list. And the MOU basically states, you know, uh, again, there's no cost. And, and we are articulating how we will work together and how we will support you. Not only uh, will we uh, provide the courses, but we will build, maintain, and update a custom landing page with your school information and logo uh, where your your students and, or your employees or your staff can come and, and engage very easily with the courses that you are recommending. And I'm going to show you a couple uh, examples. Again, I'm going to get out of my slideshow, and I'm going to go to Sailor. Let's see. Oh, actually, I have some in my slide. Oh, excuse me. Let me go back to my slideshow. Here we are. And here are a couple examples of what a partner page looks like. Here is one from uh, the Universidad Pedagogica de Maputo in Mozambique. And as you can see, we've customized a page. We will build this page and provide you with the link to use as you will on your website. We have their information their list of courses that they've selected. And then your users can simply come to uh, this page and again, engage with the course. So that is basically uh, uh, in the nutshell, in a very quick 15 minutes, what Sailor Academy is about. And we want all of you to know that we are here and uh, we would love to talk to any of you uh, after the conference. Please come to our website, explore, our website, explore our courses. They're open and readily available. Uh, and also follow us on, on the social media. We, you see where you see students uh, uh, posting uh, their certificates and also we, where we will announce uh, new releases of new courses. So again, here is our contact information. And Jackie and I uh, want to thank you for this time to be with you. And uh, please do reach out to us and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Please let's read for them. We we'll just pick one, two questions, two quick questions. If there is okay. uh, from the audience. So the, um, please you mention your name and then you ask your question. Okay. Thank you very much. Anything? Yes, okay. Okay, so you can use the other mic if it's okay. Okay, thank you. My name is Dr. Iman Rokiche from the University of Environment and Sustainable Development, Somania. Yes, um, during the presentation, I could see free certificate. Um, I want to know whether it is possible to just go onto the site and download a certificate and you know just go about saying you have a certificate or there are mechanisms whether they check the processes you go through acquiring the knowledge before you are enabled to have the certificate okay so and the last question so that they address it for us the last question 
Okay, so please your name and yeah, my name is Steven Adingo, University of Ghana. Um, so I had free, free, free. So I wanted to know um, the expert they consult to in the course development. Do they also do it for free, or um, they so, are renovated? So who is paying for it? How is it being developed? Exactly. Okay, that's fine. The, okay, you just last one, and they answer all three within three minutes for me. Thank you very much. Um, My name is George Amson from University of Environment and Sustainable Development. I want to find out whether the program is accredited. What the accreditation yes, process? Yes, accreditation process. Okay, Are the for programs the accredited? Various programs they have online. Okay, that's why. So, over to you, Cherries. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the first question regarding the certificates they are issued digitally. However, that you may download them and print them if you would like. So you have both formats uh, to uh, frame or, or to share digitally or, or to put into a portfolio digitally. Uh, Sharice, is it okay if I interject? Um, yes, I please. Think the, I think the question um, was focusing on how do you earn a certificate? Can you just go uh, to our site and download one? Um, and that no. answer is no. So certificates are issued once students um, complete an exam through our learning management system. Um, so we do have protocols to make sure that certificates are not forged, but that's a great question. Okay. Are there any other of the questions that you want me to take or would you like to, would you like to? Oh, well, you, go, can, you, you can uh, continue if you'd like. Okay, because um, I think I can fold the, the second and third questions kind of into each other. What's the background of the program? How is, how is it free and, and what are our credentials? Um, so <clears throat> Cherise gave a great overview, thank you so much Cherise, of our instructional design process. We are a nonprofit. We are actually in the process of developing a university program, but we're not yet a university. Um, we, in addition to our internal um, quality assurance processes. We have a group of courses that have been um, evaluated and recommended for university credit by an organization called the American Council on Education. Um, and many of our US based partners um, will take those courses for credit. So students are able to transfer um, credit into a program for a certain set of courses. We use the same course development process for all of our courses, but we think that that speaks to the level of quality that we invest in the program. And as we mentioned, we work with um, consulting faculty. So faculty um, nationwide who have teaching experience as well as their um, academic credentials and academic expertise in their field. Um, and how is it available for free? That's my favorite question. It comes up every partnership meeting we, that we have. Um, we are very fortunate as a nonprofit. We have um, a benefactor, Michael Saylor, who has set this up as his philanthropy. Um, very quick backstory, because I know that we are short on time, is that um, Michael Saylor uh, grew up with very modest means and was able to attend um, the university that he attended, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is a very prestigious um, institution in the US uh, because he was able to receive a full ride um, our Army ROTC scholarship. And because of that free education, he went on to be a very successful entrepreneur. If you're in the cryptocurrency space, you probably recognize his name as well, or in the tech space. Uh, but this is part of his philanthropy, his way of paying it forward. And we've been doing this work um, since at least um, 2008, um, some of it under a different name, the Sailor Foundation. Um, so I hope that answers all of those really great um, questions. Uh, if you have additional questions, please do reach out to us by email or um, feel free to go on to our site for additional information. Okay, thank you very much, Sherry's Gardner and Jacqueline Arnold. We appreciate your time with us. Thank you. Very Our pleasure. Very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay, let's do it for them.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we go to our next session, remember that the people who have helped us with this event is Bell Aqua, Mortinec Enterprise, Asib Limited, Aquafields Construction Limited. So this is, if you've not drunk your Bell Aqua, remember to drink one and look for one to buy. They, they said they have other products there which I didn't know of, it's strange. Tissue, um, takeaway packs and a lot of things. So you can go there. There's a special discount for, of 20% on the water today. So for those who are here, make sure you pick some for your family if you don't drink water. So thank you very much. Okay, so we'll, before the next session, we are, there's a, an evaluation we want to do, be an evaluation of the program. So um, they will project it and then you scan it with your phone. For those who, are, who find it difficult to scan, there's a, a, a link you can type. The ushers are around. My technical team will project it for me, the, the e-learning conference evaluation form and then the ushers will pass it around. Let's use about two minutes to um, scan and get the evaluation done. So please make sure you have one. Just, just quickly, if you are struggling, look for help. My technical team, Adam, I'm, I'm not seen on stage. Oscar. But it's been passed. Yes, it's now showing. So you can you you can scan it with your phone. Yes. Okay. So you 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 scan it for me. And please, when you finish, you scan, and then you do the evaluation. So I'm waiting for you to do them for us. The goal is to improve and make sure that next year's conference will be bigger and better. So that's the goal of the evaluation, to correct when it needs to be corrected, add what we need to add, maintain what we need to maintain. So I'm waiting for you. Those online, you can also scan and make sure you, you, you evaluate for us. Our on, online audience, we also appreciate you. So we want to say that try and then scan for us. If you are having problems, please raise your hand. Somebody will help you or talk to your neighbor. Sometimes your neighbor will have a solution and you'll be, you'll be in trouble. So if you are struggling, talk to your neighbor. If you are still struggling, then you raise your hand up. I, are you done with it? Who is not done yet? Okay. So, two more minutes. Try and evaluate. Okay, are we almost done? Somebody is done here. 
Okay, done. This side. Okay, whilst we, those who have finished, please remember to share the link again for the, the link, or the YouTube link. The last session is about starting. Tell your friend to tell your friend. Share the link if you are done with. So if any platform you are on, your school platform, your college platform, even if your school doesn't have a name, you schooled by yourself, please send it to your family members. We want to, a lot of people to join this important discussion that we are about having. Okay, so I think that we, who, who is not done yet? I don't see any hands. So by that, I'm assuming that everybody has done that. We move straight to our next session. Our next session is, is, is one of the things that excites me. In fact, I've been asking about it and thinking about it. We will be discussing an important issue to us as e-learning practitioners. And that issue is generative AI language models in tertiary education. Are we empowering students or undermining academic integrity? That is the issue for discussion. And to help me us do this discussion, are a team of experts that we have brought together. The first one being Dr. Linda Amwakobenin from Computer Science Department, KNUST. So please let's clap as she joins our stage. Dr. Linda Amwakobani. Oh, please clap for her. Ladies first, you see, and she's my course mate, so please. Okay, so then the next person to help us do this discussion is Dr. Emmanuel Ahini from Computer Science Department in KNUST. Please put your hands together. Okay, Doc, I want to blend. Then Dr. Cyril D. Boateng from the Fixes Department. Please put your hands together for him. And to moderate this session is a, a good friend of mine, a drama person an intelligent young man, focuses on thin film for photovoltaic applications. I didn't do these kinds of fixes, so. And then low temperature fixes and device automation with a focus on instrumentation and an enthusiastic fan of AI. Please, let's do it up for the moderator, Dr. Achana Brichum from the Fixes Department. So we'll leave, oh, please clap for him as he sits down. You jot all your questions down, they will be taking us to a doc, your audience. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And Welcome to this very important and interesting conversation that we are going to be having on generative AI models in tertiary education, whether it's empowering student creativity or undermining academic integrity. Um, so 
my name is, as has already been said, my name is Achana Brishun. I'm a lecturer at the Department of Physics. Um, last year, November last year, there was a significant milestone in generative AIs. Um, a company, OpenAI, released their ChatGPT software, and it became public. And once it became public, it made it very easy for everybody to have access to using this tool to create content. Now, <clears throat> with this ease of access, there was a, a growing concern amongst the academ amongst academic institutions worldwide about how it, can, it could be used to undermine the authenticity of student work and assessment, or whether it was also going to be used to improve student creativity. And as educators, one of our responsibilities is to address these concerns and find a balance between empowering student creativity and upholding the principles of academic integrity. And so throughout this panel discussion this afternoon, we'll be exploring the potential benefits of generative AI models in tertiary education and examining how they can enhance student cre creativity, teach, student teaching, student learning, and student experiences, and also academic research. At the same time, we also delve into the challenges that they pose to maintaining academic integrity, and we will also discuss policies and ethical considerations that can help mitigate these concerns. And so I'm very honored today to introduce to, to you these panelists we have here. We have Dr. Ahene, Emmanuel Ahene, who is a lecturer, the department, lecturer in research at the Department of Computer Science. His research interests include cybersecurity and machine learning. Dr. Ahene, thank you so much for being here with yeah, us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Then we have Dr. Linda Amaku Banning, who is also a lecturer and researcher at the Department of Computer Science. Her research interests and area are in the areas of um, natural language processing, and she has a focus on computational linguistics. And then last but not the least, Dr. Cyril Boating, who is also a lecturer and a researcher at the Department of Physics, who focuses on applications of AI in geophysics for natural resource exploration. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a very exciting and very experienced panel with us. And then we also have you here whose areas of expertise are very broad and will also participate fully in this conversation. So a round of applause for everybody who is here. Okay, so let's um, hit the ground running, as it were. Um, my, my first question will go to you, Dr. Ahene. Um, I want us to talk about exploring the potential benefits of generative AI models. And so my question to you is twofold. First and foremost, what are generative AIs and how can they empower student creativity in tertiary education? And if you have any specific examples, you can share with us. So Dr. Ahene. All right, thank you. Thank you, Doc, and um, very good afternoon to all of you. Um, I really do acknowledge the presence of our honorable um, audience here. Um, so to go to the question, what is a generative AI model? So first of all, I'd say it's akin to human brain and how as human beings, we are able to learn something over time and then when we are faced with a challenge, we are able to really go around that by ourselves. So generative AI models are typically models that are trained you know, with a large, in fact, very large data set on the internet. And what it does is to learn the patterns, the context you know, in the data so that when um, it is queried with a question or a prompt, it is able to um, give a response, you know, that is more coherent and contextualized. Usually, we would find them as new content, you know, that, that um, we really do appreciate. And the very common one is the uh, generative pre-trained transformers, GPT for short, uh, which we know that um, OpenAI went ahead to build a chatbot on that, and a lot of people are having fun with that. Um, I think when I read the news, I saw that in just two days after it was launched, it got more than 100 million users. So that's fantastic. And all of us here perhaps have used it one way or the other. Now, the thing is that that's not the only generative AI model on the internet. There's pretty much a lot. Um, 
and then um, this chatbot we are talking about, ChatGPT, it's largely text-based. And so you would also find other generative AI models doing pretty much well, like ChatGPT also on the internet, to provide new content on code, videos, images, and so on and so forth. So if you look at the question of how these models can empower student creativity, then well, I'll say that personally, I, I believe that generative AI models would provide resources and also would provide enough tools that can enable students to be inspired, you know, to enhance their creative processes. And I'm gonna give you two examples of some tools. Like, for instance, if you look at a tool called um, um, deepart.io, and another nice one, I mean, you guys should check that one out, it's called Runway, okay? It's a fantastic AI tool on the internet. Now, if you look at these two tools, they can be used by art students, particularly to enhance their creative process, all right? So if, how, how it works is just pretty much the same thing as um, ChatGPT does. You would have to input a prompt, and then Runway will just give you some fantastic feedback. And you know, what happens to the student is that the student gets to experiment. You know, he gets an assistance of data from this um, chatbot, and with that, he's able to experiment different artistic concepts, and he's able to explore different styles, you know, and these examples, numerous examples that he would see would actually inspire him, you know, or her to build upon that and to be able to create something that is a bit out of the box. Okay, so th that is a clear example of how um, generative AI tools can enable people to be creative. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahemi. Um, so, Dr. Mwakun, um, Dr. Ahemi has just told us about how this can foster out of the box, generative AI can foster out of the box thinking for students. My question to you is how can these models enhance teaching, especially, and learning experiences? So, when I say teaching and learning experiences, I'm speaking from the from the point of the educational instructor, how, how can they use these tools within the education, tertiary educational framework to enhance teaching and learning? Okay, so um, let me start with an example, my own example. Not too long ago, I had to come up with course content for a course I hadn't taught before. And I knew the course, it's a computer science course. I have a general idea what the course is about. But I didn't know the nitty gritties. I had to do like 24 hours of teaching. And so I went to Chad's GPT. I put in the course and I asked for a course outline. It gave me a fantastic outline. And when I checked with textbooks, I realized that it was, it was correct, <laughs> surprisingly. Well, maybe I shouldn't be surprised. But it, it was, if I had decided, from, from an educator's point of view, if I had, I've, I, have, I have had to go to the library, go and do research, it would have taken me two, three, five, ten hours to come up with that proper outline in a particular order. But in like 30 seconds, I had a complete thing. It even gave me explanations of what to treat under each one of those topics. And so for, for educators, it is a fantastic tool. It speeds up our research things. On the side of the learner, I have a lot of students. This semester, my students are about 1,600 different, different programs. If everybody is supposed to access me for explanation to something I taught in class, it is I'm going to die. I don't plan to die soon, I enjoy my life. So if they have access to a system like this, they could just go to it, put in a query, and it gives them an explanation. So it works on that angle. For, for both sides, I think it is a very handy tool. It's, 
it saves us time, it gives us accurate content, and it, it helps with research, it helps with everything we are doing. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Bako. Um, Dr. Boating, so with respect to, your question is with respect to academic research and innovation, how can we, or how is Gentive AI going to be a positive impact in that area? Because as, as tertiary educators, an important area of our work to educate is to involve ourselves in top-notch academic research and in top-notch academic innovation. So how, how can we, or what are the positive impacts of um, Gentive AIs in this area? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, hello. Um, so yes, uh, generative AI models, um, uh, like Dr. Uh, Bannon said, can reduce the time you need to work. So for instance, le let, me, let me give you a very good example. You want to, I'm in geophysics. I want to research um, in geophysics. I want to find out the latest innovations in geophysics or what the trend is. Now, here is a model that has scanned, um, let's say the first model has come from 2019, I think, to with all the information on the internet. So you had access to all this information. Now, so it can go to all this information and tell me what has been a trend in geophysics. Um, if, if I'm talking about petroleum exploration using geophysics, it can do, go through all that data and tell me that this is the trend. And I've actually done that. I, I, a couple of months ago, um, just to test the model, I, I, I went in there and I said, okay, what is the latest trend in geophysical exploration uh, for petroleum, right? And then it gives you a couple of points. Then I re-engineer the prompt again. I type in, okay, for, um, so f in that particular um, example, uh, ChatGPT told me that the, the latest trend is using AI and machine learning tools in petroleum exploration, integrating all the data, which is actually true from my own experience, but that's my area. Then I went to machine learning and AI. What specific algorithms are to be explored, are to be further explored and have um, problems that have not been solved? Then it leads them for me, deep learning, uh, computational, um, um, uh, how do you call them, um, convolutional neural networks. It listed all of them, right? So that, that, that cuts my work out by, let's say, something I would have taken a month to do, scanning papers, um, looking through different uh, documents, and then ChatGPT was able to do that for you in like 30 minutes, right? The, the only challenge with that is that you have to be able to give the right prompt, right? But if, if, if you are able to do that, you get the right results. A second thing I can mention, for instance, as, and I'm sure we've all experienced this, you, you, you take your time, write a nice paper, right? And then um, you submit to a journal, especially from our end of the world, and then you realize that they tell you that a lot of the things, um, a reviewer tells you that um, the English is wrong. Usually they are not able to tell you exactly what is wrong with the English. Right. But from my personal experience, I think it's, it's a matter of um, context. From where you are coming, the way you, you write, it's a slightly different from how an American will write, how a, a, an Australian will write. Right. Because I have done this several times. I argue out with editors and, uh, and reviewers. What, what is the grammatical problem with the sentence? And they cannot really tell you that. But they will tell you that they don't feel the, the English is right. You get the thing. But one thing I've seen is that I, I think it's a problem of um, um, style because of where we are coming from. Now, this um, uh, generative AI models can eliminate that. Given that I've written a whole document, I want that document to have, let's say I'm sending to an American journal. I want that document to have an American feel. You can take all that information. So this is not just generating, telling ChatGPT to give you information, no. You've written your whole paper. Now you copy that text, put it into um, ChatGPT and tell ChatGPT to reformat and rephrase this in an American style. You can even be more specific uh, in the style of a Stanford professor in geophysics. ChatGPT can actually take that and do that for you. So this is your own material. It's not material from some, it's not like you are generating the material from ChatGPT. But if any of you have the time, you can try that after here. Some material that you've already, already written, put it in ChatGPT and tell it to do that. And you see that the material that comes out is still your own content, but just that the phrasing is sharper, right? And it fits a certain context. And that's another way that I think generative AI models can help. In the future, I think we can even go a notch higher, where we ourselves can build niche applications. So I can choose to, to use the 
uh, uh, ChatGPT API and build a niche application in geophysics or petroleum exploration so that it fits my context so well that anytime I put any prompt in there, he knows that this guy is speaking in terms of hydrocarbon exploration, in terms of geophysics. And then the output it gives will, be, will fit your, your distance very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Boateng. Um, as you're talking, then it's like I, could, I, can, I can feel that some people are saying, wow. But um, there are some concerns because academic integrity um, Dr. Mwakum, uh, you see, there are some challenges to academic integrity, maintaining academic integrity in tertiary education. And so my question to you is, how do these generative AI models affect the authenticity of student work and assessment? Um, that's a good question. Let me give you a classic example. Well. My personal opinion has been that, and please don't misunderstand me, it's a very great tool, but it has made nonsense of assignments we give to students. I asked my project student to bring me a proposal on a topic. When I, and what I do, I have a lot of students, I don't have time to read a lot of, you understand. So I need to run it. Every, every document I get, I put it through Turnitin to be sure that plagiarism is at an acceptable level, level before I read. I put it in, and it was 1%. And I'm like, wow, fantastic. This is a good student. Yay. Once in a while, I have got somebody I can work with. But Turnitin has this AI tool button. When I checked, 100%. 100% AI generated, and I'm thinking, so just taking the topic, just taking what the student, and it was, it was a good topic. It was a fantastic way he was exploring um, something in inconsistency, in mathematical things when you're doing programming, where you can, um, you, you shorten along something like the pi. Pi is 3.14, something, something, something. If, even if you remove one of the last digits, it can, come back with a, a big inconsistency at some point in, in your program. I thought it was fantastic. But assuming I hadn't checked, I would have signed off that project and it would have been totally, totally not human. So that is one of the things. If you are not careful, fraud, plagiarism, um, just people taking content, that is not theirs. Another thing I have noticed is, and I've tried it myself, where I will go and put in a, a query and say, give me the Python code to do so and so. And it gives me a fantastic code. Then I can come back and tell ChatGPT, oh, this part of the code didn't work. Can you give me something else? And then it will respond like a human being. Of course, when you do so and so, this is actually the problem. So do this way. And Consistently, I have queried students who have brought me work and seen that they don't understand what they've submitted as an assignment. I don't really have a, with, with programming, you can copy code off the internet, but understand it. Students don't try to understand what they are bringing. So far as an, it's an assignment and the code, they don't even try to run the code themselves. And so it is, like I'm saying, it is a fantastic tool, but it's also a big problem now, For on all levels, <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, um, yeah, this fantastic tool, that's a big challenge. So, Cyril, um, are there strategies or safeguards that we can, that can be implemented to mitigate some of these concerns? Because students are not going to stop using ChatGPT, and more and more of them are going to be discovering it and finding out innovative ways of using it to reduce their workload. So, yeah. So that's an interesting question. It's, it's something that I think we are all still trying to navigate. Um, but what is going to happen now is um, the first strategy, I think, is that it's going to put a lot more responsibility on us as educators um, to raise the bar in terms of the kinds of questions we ask. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, you, I teach general physics for engineers, um, engineering students, first year. So it's usually um, an introduction to the whole field of physics. 
because they'll be using as a basis for their engineering. So the first topic is scientific methods, and then we do measurements and unit. So I, I give an assignment to try and um, to make the students innovative, um, invent a measurement, um, a new uh, quantity, how to even measure it, invent it, and tell me about it, the units you use, how you, just because we'll go through the history of how measurements were created from the Greek, Greeks to the, the uh, Greeks to Romans and all that. Um, usually before ChatGPT came, last year, it was quite easy because I knew they were not going to do, going to look for it. But then this year, I, I knew that this is what was good. If I take, give them that assignment, they are just going to type it in and, and get results. So, so what I did was then, I gave a specific example. Assume that you are in the 1600s and you are Otun for, that's Antihini for those of you, you are his special advisor. And Otun for has decided that every household in Kumasi um, should use a specific unit for measuring food in their homes, right? Um, give me design a measurement tool and, and a unit for that, right? And I, I gave them an example that the specific one I will use is that imagine that in 1600s, um, the Asantini had decided that every fufu, when you cook fufu in your house, the, the, the measurement unit for fufu is maybe his fist, right? So that for every house, there's a measurement tool from his fist. It's a mold from his fist. And that is the only thing you can use to measure the fufu that you give people. So if you are going to give maybe the dad in the house, you need two fists of Otunfo. If you are going to give the kid, you need one. So that was the example I gave. So if that is the example, now use that as the template and generate new tools. Because I've limited that to a context here, you can't go and type into ChatGPT. <laughs> Do you understand? Whatever you go and put in there, it will immediately be clear that you are off track. You get it. So that's one of the strategies, I think. It's only that it's going to put a little bit more... Um, responsibility on us as educators. We need to do a little bit more work, a little bit of more research. But I think that strategy is key. What they can also do is that then the kind of students we will be training, it will raise the bar. They will need to be really, really, really innovative. They can't just go and say, I'm, I'm thinking up something and then writing it, putting the prompt in charge GPT and bringing it to you. But by the time they are done with that assignment, I'm hopeful that they would have gone through the process of thinking about how measurements and units across history um, um, came up to where we are now, where we all use the, the feet and every, everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that very insightful answer. So we have a lot more work to do as, as academics, as educators. We need to reinvent the way we are assessing our students to make it more challenging for them to think and rather than just going to put a prompt into chat GPT. But Dr. Ahene, are there some ethical considerations that we should take into account when using generative AI models in an educational context? And also, what are some of the limitations of the current technologies and how do they affect the quality of student work and learning? So that's a twofold question to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so this is one of the fundamental issues. I mean, how we can use generative AIs responsibly and, you know, equitably. It's, it's a very fundamental issue that is associated with the widespread of, you know, adoption of this technology in institutions. In fact, the last time I checked, somewhere in April, about close to about 30 countries had either provisionally banned or completely banned the use of ChatGPT, for instance, you know, on the grounds of ethical issues, for instance, academic integrity, for privacy reasons, and for biasness, you know, and so on and so forth. Now, these are very, very important issues um, that we as educators need to be really mindful of and begin to work seriously at them because uh, the thing is that the technology has really come to stay and whether we like it or not, our students have wonderful ways of, you know, going by things, right? So I love the example that my brother really gave. It's a fantastic one. But, you know, there is a whole dimension called prompt engineering, you know, where students now would have developed the skills to, you know, prompt engineer. Regardless of the question you give, they are able to 
find a context and, and then go behind that and get the answers. So the critical thing, if you would take um, um, academic integrity, for instance, the critical thing is that we should now be looking at how we can encourage in-class assignment. Okay, that's one key thing. And we should also try to encourage um, non-reading assignments. All right, so, and it, when we do that in this way, we are also getting the students to be very, very empowered. You know, learning how to speak in public and so on. And many of the students do not really know how to speak in public. So if we change the way we give the assignments from written to non-written, then we, I mean, if it's applicable to your area, I must say, then we, we get to also have a positive aspect of getting creativity out, out of the students. Okay, so that's one thing we could look at. And also on privacy issue, um, a country like Italy, for instance, they previously banned chat GPT, but recently they have lifted the ban. And the reason that they, for which they banned it was that chat GPT in itself is not able to determine how old someone is when they are assessing the system, right? So the problem is that you would have little minors or minors who are um, getting responses inappropriately from chat GPT. And this is still a problem. Okay, this is still a problem till now. So this is a major ethical issue. And if you look at how to go around this, then it now becomes very important for policymakers to look at how you know, we'll build our, our frameworks and policies around this to ensure that um, these things are somehow controlled. Maybe the last one I'll talk about is the biasness. Okay, this is also one ethical issue you know, um, that, that's mainly related to generative AI models. And the, and the problem really comes out from um, the training phase. Because most data, training data, may be a bit biased, so you end up having the, the model giving you discriminatory responses. Okay, and, and this turns out to be sometimes a problem. And those of us who are here in, in Africa, you would realize that most of these generative AI tools um, do not have that Afrocentric you know, you know, thing in it. So you tend to not be having uh, very good answers related to that. So these are all um, ethical issues that I think as educators we, we should be mindful of and begin to work at them. Now you, the second question is about <laughs> the limitations, right? So um, it's a known fact that GPT, for instance, uh, the knowledge base is up to 2021 20, September. So it's not going to be extremely creative beyond its knowledge base. So we say it has a knowledge cutoff. Okay, so uh, it is important for all educators and even students to get that understanding that GPT is not going to be able to give you very good answers when you query it about a technology that um, progresses. I'll give you an example. So if you would type in chat GPT right now, can you tell me the features of uh, iPhone 14? I mean, the good features of iPhone 14. It, it knows nothing about that. Honestly, you can do that right now. But what it can do is that it can look at history, maybe the series of iPhones that have been released, and then suggest to you that he thinks that these are going to be good features of, of this. Now, UNESCO suggests something. UNESCO says that if you're using these tools, for instance, ChatGPT, and you're not an expert, to validate the output that comes from the, um, the tool, then it is really unsafe to use this. So that really throws more light to the fact that we should now be looking at these tools as assistive technologies and not as a replacement you know, for, for all the solutions that we have. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, AI generated tools are assistive technologies and not uh, replacement technologies. That's very useful for us to note. Um, outside of academia, are there any challenges that these tools um, goes to? <laughs> okay, Linda. No, I wanted to ask Dr. Ahini a question because ah, we are at an e-learning conference <laughs> where we are encouraging people to go online. Uh -huh. Now you are saying that because of chat GPT, uh -huh. we should take assessments face-to-face -face in class. 
How do we reconcile that with the conference oh, yeah, we are at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Zoom is also a class. <laughs> if you're doing class online, it's also a class. Yeah, so, um, so I think the, the major component there is you are getting students to talk, okay, and to get creative. Not necessarily. Um, yeah, not necessarily, in yes, person. in person. Um, I remember there was an example that this gentleman raised, which, I mean, is something that I've actually seen over and over as a good way. Um, it may not really work in all cases, but sometimes it does. So if, let's say, you want to change your style of teaching, because most educators, our approach to teaching is there is a method. I teach you how to use the method, and then you practice over and over. I give you an assignment, and then you use the method to solve it. Now, the thing is that ChatGPT has already ingested teacher's manual. Okay, so it's able to really do this that fast. So you want to get students to be extremely creative by sharing alternative ways of solving problems. So you turn around the teaching approach. Instead of giving questions later, you rather throw the questions in early at the start. And then you are eliciting for ideas that will come up. And then you now begin to see. Now you, you could even take this as a quiz or something. And then you award students who are able to speak up, giving answers. Then you, we, we will, in this way, be exploring, uh, you know, greater depths of uh, the student's ability that would be very useful for uh, education. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for your question, Linda, and thank you very much for your answer. Um, so yeah, so back to the question I asked again about um, um, the, I asked the question about the challenges of these generated tools outside, yeah, outside of, academia. of academia. Yes. So okay, so, <laughs> so it's just at me again. So, it, yeah, it's okay. I, I, I can say that in, in Cyril. I'm it's sure Cyril will add just that. Yeah. So quite a brief one. So you you would see outs, outside of, well, I, I, I wouldn't really say outside of academia because it turns out, again, to become like a research problem because now we are having these areas of deep fake technologies uh, with, you know, deep fake audios, deep fake um, videos. And even the tool that Dr. I Hini, mentioned. Dr. Hini, what are deep fakes? <laughs> okay, so fake. <laughs> Certainly not it. You, you just take a face of someone and then you are able to either change their color or you are able to put them on another head, you know, like stuff like that, all right? And you are trying to, you are trying to basically say this is the representation of the person, but that's not actually him, okay? Doing something else and so on and so forth. So if you look at the tool I mentioned first, the runway ML, you can use that tool to typically erase someone from a video. Yeah, and it works fine. You know, and you would watch the video and you think the person actually wasn't in. You see, so that's how far these things are going. Yeah, and it's, it's a bit uh, scary <laughs> at some point. Zero. Oh, yeah, so yeah, he's there. I'm laughing because yesterday he shared a picture of. Uh, <laughs> I uh, think I gave chat to the technical Vladimir team. Putin as a black man. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, you so, see that. So one. that's uh, yes. Putin as a. Even African. Putin will never believe it. And that's that's an example of a deep fake. <laughs> so he shared that yeah. yesterday. Uh, and awesome. I think recently um, we were at an AI conference actually, and then this news came up. Um, there was a, a, a picture of um, a plane crashing into, I think, or uh -huh. a bomb around Pentagon in the US. Yeah. And then I think it spread all over. Some news outlets started um, running it, mm. and then the stock market dipped. Mm. Because then people thought there was something happening. Mm. But, but it was totally fake. Before the like, um, 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 government's uh, official dome reacted and said, it's not true, it's fake. But by then, it had gone round yeah. the circuit. And you yeah. know, right now with WhatsApp and all these our uh, digital tools, things can spread very fast. So the danger um, you're asking about is, is real, right? Um, and, and the unfortunate thing is that, unfortunate is that um, with open AI giving access to everybody, um, to, uh, AI generative tools, that's the problem that is happening now. We've created a different problem where everybody has access to now, If everybody has access to a new technology, and this is a new technology, it's not even a year old, uh, in terms of chat GPT, yeah. but I mean other ones have been around. But ChatGPT was, is like, it opened everything to the world. And if you have a new technology, of course, there are people who are going to try and take advantage and use it for something bad. There are malicious players out there, they will think of you. So um, the unfortunate part is governments have not been reactive enough. Regulation is not there. Policies have not been put in place. Um, a lot of, I remember when, when ChatGPT came, 
there was this whole conversation, um, uh, Sylvia and some of the journals first totally banned it, then, then they brought in a new policy that said it's partially banned, then there was like a whole lot of conversation and now they say, okay, you have to use a percentage and then, you know, and then initially people were publishing, actually co-authors, uh, co GPT was said as a co-author. Now it's no longer the case, it's not allowed. You can't do that because uh, Charge GPT cannot take responsibility for whatever is written in it. So that's the thing. We've all been scrambling around, right? We need to take a deep breath and then um, um, people sit down, uh, plan, policies should be put in place. But as you know, with a lot of these digital technologies, um, our countries, governments, and everybody else has been slow to respond. Uh, so hopefully to be done in the future, because if not, it can be scary. Okay, so, um, so Cyril, I have a follow-up question to you, and knowing that the Pro Vice Chancellor is here, um, I, I we, we want to look at finding a common ground, and what do you think institutions can do to achieve this balance? And we can use an institution like KNUST. How do we find a healthy balance from a policy perspective? So, um, one great thing that is happening is what you're having here, the conversation. So, um, and, and we've had this conversation among ourselves sometimes. Other, there's no conversation around this. Um, so, we have two sides. There are people who think it's really good, and there are people who say this is really bad. And then both sides are, are on both opposite sides, right? Uh, but there should first be a conversation where we all come to the table and say, what do we do with this new technology? Because like Dr. Hini mentioned earlier on, the technology is here to stay. It's not going to disappear. And people talk about chat GPT because that's what you know. But there are lots of other ones out there that you don't even know of, <laughs> right? So, and now you can even, some of the APIs, are, they are there. Students can actually build their own tools and use, right? And they can, if, if they, they learn prompt engineering very well, it can actually really, really be good. You understand? So the first thing is to have this conversation. So I thank the e-learning center for, for creating this yeah. opportunity for this yeah. panel. That's good. And then we need to um, raise it a little bit higher. Um, in different departments, I think we should all have a conversation around that. How, how can we, let's say, the first example I gave, how can we generate questions that would not necessarily just let our students go and then um, run them through generative AI tools and come and give us the answers. Um, then we need to work on policies. Exactly how do you want to approach this? That can happen at the university level. It has to happen. If not, as for the students, they are using it. Whether you like it or not, they are using it now. So we need to have a conversation around that. Uh, and then get policies in place. Um, uh, and then the, the last part, which I think is very important, is that we need to actually engage our students. Like Dr. Hini said, and, uh, <laughs> I, I actually think it's a great tool, but it's an assistive tool. So can we teach our students to see it as an assistive tool? Nobody sees um, a calculator and thinks, this solves all my problems. You don't see a calculator and say, oh, they, when I have a calculator, I know mass. No. Right? It's the same way that students should look at generative AI tools. You can't have it and then say, oh, because of that, I'm the smartest person in the world. Do you understand? But how do, they, how do you use it? If you can teach students how to use it really well, um, then it, it will be a great tool for them. How to write, even CVs, how to write application letters. Sometimes the application letters you get when you ask students to apply for stuff are terrible. But if we teach them how to use some of these tools, they don't really have to go through every uh, um, um, step. You can draft something and let the AI tool polish it up for you, and then you send it off. So I think we need to engage students. We need to teach them how to use these tools. But if you leave it hanging, that one will not work. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, I'd like to ask if there are any questions from the audience. Any questions or contributions? Yes. Can we, get a, can we get a microphone? Please, you introduce yourself and your institution. So, okay, let me see by hands those who have questions. So please, because of time and people traveling, we'll take just three and we'll continue on the argument later because this one, I'm sure 10 days we will be here on chat GPT. So, can we get the one, okay. two? Hello. So, okay, so one, you raise your hand. Hello. Yes. Um, yes, thank you very much for the discussion. I mean, it's 
I'm happy that um, you are now talking about engaging the students because there are other platforms, as you said. We have, we have Chat PDF. It will convert the journals into a very nice summary for you. Chat DTP doesn't do projects. It doesn't do pictures. But we have um, Excel that does that. So there are other um, AI tools that are quite helpful. I don't want us to look at it as if it is. Um, it gives a lot of um, it gives a lot of garbage. But you see, the people who 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 put them together are not from here. So it's up to us to say, okay, we want to create something like what the AI tool we need in order for it to come into our context. For all you may know, it will come from a student. So it is okay for us to um, educate them on it. Some of them have more insights even in the tools than we do because the current generation are very IT inclined. So when we, when we engage them, one of the things we, we can let them do is to generate something that we can use for our environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm John Akwesi Amponsa, representing <coughs> Ghana National Association of Authors and Publishers. Yeah. Um, hmm. <laughs> I, I congratulate not only the speakers, but the entire university for such a fantastic, innovative initiative. In fact, it is bringing a whole lot of change at the mental level, and we shall see to it that it also gets its legs within the corporate system. Now, all that I have been listening to from the discussion is a problem that is emerging. And the problem I see emerging here is the problem of, in code, where are our academic researchers and where are their materials? And how are their materials part of chat GTP, resource-based materials that fetches for information? So if we don't take care, GTP and AI systems are going to cut us off the system and then promote researches of the, in quote, West, not with biases. What is happening right now is that we still have millions of our academic materials traditionally packaged in library votes, which requires students to go and make references to them. Some of these materials are also done by the very professors who are teaching the students. Is it not embarrassing to see that your own research material should have been cited in a literature review, but unfortunately, due to dependence or over-dependence of these AI technologies, you yourself are left out. You, the lecturer, are left out. So alternatively, I wish to call our attention to basing on our knowledge as experts to generate our own AI too, possibly. And secondly, to make sure that we link the faculties and make sure all academic researches are transformed digitally. Once they are transformed digitally and they can be found on the online platform, then of course, chat GTP and any other AI can see it because the only eye to see will be a digital eye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Cyril wants to respond, so Cyril. Well, respond. Just, yeah. just to yeah. add, uh, thanks for, but I think KNUST, for instance, has a digital um, uh, repository of all, I think, theses, and most of the lecturers here publish papers when they, they, they do their stuff. So all that is also, has also been picked up. It's in there somewhere. Um, so, so actually, our information is not missing in that thing. The, the only problem is that, of course, relative to how much information is generated in the West and Africa, it's, um, like Dr. Haney said, Afrocentric data is it's, it's minimal, right? But there's a lot of work ongoing. Um, I was in a, in, a, in a conference just last month in, in, in Rwanda, uh, Africa AI com community, and there's a lot of data that is being generated and loading up. So it's actually, we, we are not far behind. We are catching up. So don't worry. We'll all get there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, I have a quick intervention. Please, can you off your mic? Oh, it's, it's, we can't hear you. Ah, okay. Yes, so um, it's, um, like you mentioned, there's pros and there's cons. And I will just follow up with what my colleague said. The engagement with the students is very, very critical if we really want to uh, navigate to this complexity. One thing I've found is useful, which I want to share, is engaging the student on it. Um, last month, I have some students who presented some work. So there's actually a counter um, site called Zero GBT. So we all sat down, copied the work, put it in there. 70%, 50%, they saw it. So once you begin to engage them, what I found is that when you let them know that they could be caught, when they don't genuinely write, even when they have generated it, they sit down, read the work, edit it out. That is part of us learning. So they are not really copying and throwing the things out, but they come to do some work, which in a way help them to even imbibe whatever they are submitting. So I think we cannot, like the doc say, thousands of centers cannot engage all of, the, all of them, but there's a way we can also let them be aware that when they submit, we have checks and balances, and that puts, that awareness makes them uh, kind of rework when they are submitting some of this work. Thank you. Students were raising their hands, but I think it's just where we allow one student, privacy with your permission, to ask his question, and then the rest we would continue on the discussions later. So, All right. oh. so thank you. My, my name is Elvis Eric. Your name and your course. Sure. sure. Um, I'm an international business student, third year. Okay. All right. So uh, what I have to say is um, concerning what um, Prof said. Um, there are still AI tools that could counter um, all the checks that you still do. So for example, I could use um, Quillbots to try and uh, counter whatever research you do for it to still look perfectly human. So what I'm suggesting is we should find out ways to um, streamline adoption along these tools because it's not something that is going to stop. You can't stop human innovation. So there should be research into how are we going to help and use these tools to teach our students, make them more excellent and more presentable. And one thing too I'd like to add is, um, we shouldn't view this as a, a revolution only in, um, let's say, AI. It is happening across the health sector everywhere, right? There's disruption happening everywhere in finance and everything. So you should think about how do we uh, streamline adoption around these things? Because human innovation, you can't stop it. Thank you. Stop it. Thank you. I, I think that this it was just a comment. And um, um, panel moderator, thank you very much for your, and then your, your, your panel members. Please clap for them as I graciously dispatch you. But you see, there will be learning week 24th to um, 28th July. One of the sessions we'll look at um, chat GPT and academic, in so join us in academic integrity and then we will do that. So thank you once again very much. We want to continue on with uh, and round up our conference. My, my stage people are working on it for me. So we'll take the closing remarks from the Pro Vice Chancellor, and then we'll do some presentations. And, and the last time, please let's be upstanding and clap for him for spending time with us. He has been with us. Thank you so very much. Please take your seats. You will agree with me that we've had a fantastic, it's not exactly two days, it's, Dale, shall we say this is a day and a half? 
Yeah? Fantastic one and a half days. A round of applause for all of you who have remained seated and have participated uh, in this uh, premier e-learning or e-conference. Uh, I'm told that we have friends from Nigeria. So if I mention your country, if you're here, uh, rise to your feet and let's recognize you. All our friends from Nigeria, would you be kind enough to please rise to your feet? Let's recognize you. Nigeria? Nigeria, if you're online, you can wave at us. Nigeria, if you're online, but if you're here, please. Okay, all right, okay. Other, of course, we have our friends from the United States of America. Let's see you up on your feet. Okay, a round of applause. We have friends from Israel, my goodness. Are you here in person, Israel? Online, okay. And then, of course, we have friends from the United Kingdom. Online also? Okay, all right. Um, but before I continue, uh, friends, colleagues, you would agree with me that the planning committee of this local organizing committee that has put all of this together has done a wonderful, wonderful job. And I'd like you to acknowledge them. I'm going to be mentioning their names, members of the uh, Made in E-Learning Ghana Committee. Dr. Kwejo Boachi Buedu is the chairperson. Would you rise to your feet? And, and you may want to come, come, come. Let's recognize them. Come, come to the front here. Madam Mary Ajemai, if you are here, please join him. If you are here, please join him. Mr. Edmond Nelson, of course, Ni Amasa. Where is Ni? Amasa. Yeah. Um, lawyer, please join them. Dr. Benjamin Jampo, if you are here, please. If you are online, you may join us. <laughs> Dr. Prince Adam Japasu, if you are here, Prince. Miss Clara Puby Nyamisem, if you are here, Clara. Dr. Rydal A.C. Egan, if you are here, A.C. Mr. Isaac Marfo from the uh, Quality Assurance and Planning Office. Isaac Marfo, no? Mr. Oscar Useni Wedrago, are you here? Mr. Wedrago, okay. Dr. Eric Simpe is also a member of the uh, committee. Eric, is that you? A round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Erasmus Tete, are you here? A round of applause to Erasmus. <laughs> Mr. Godwin Boachi, if you are here, is a co-chair, finance and sponsorship subcommittee. Dr. Tete is chair, finance and sponsorship sub subcommittee. And of course, the university's, uh, university's relations officer, Dr. Norris. Dr. Daniel Norris Berquin. Are you here? No? Okay. He was chair of media and publicity subcommittee. And of course, last but not the least, Mr. Joachim Azu Akute. Now, with these reps here, I want you to give them a resounding round of applause. You have just made history. You lot have just made history. You have set the standard, and whether for good or for bad, and of course, you know, in KNUS, we do it excellently, and we do know that this is excellent. And therefore, we want to applaud you on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Management of this university for the great work that you have put into this. Thank you so very much. You may take your seats. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Now, I'm, I'm privileged to. Um, to deliver the uh, closing remarks. The Director of Digital Innovations at the Arizona State University, Dale Johnson. Executive Director, St. Louis, under the Ministry of Education. The Director, KNOST Learning Center, Professor Eric Appel Asante. He is, he is excellent. He's excellent. I keep saying to, to some of our colleagues, you know, when you get the right people to do the job for you, it becomes seamless. He's an excellent choice for the job. 
chairman of the planning committee of the e-learning Ghana conference, media team, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are online, good afternoon. We have come to the end of yet a glorious moment where we chart the course for history. And that is through the e-learning ecosystem. The purpose of this gathering was to bring together all the key stakeholders in this space, to brainstorm and to collaborate, with a view to exploring additional opportunities to bridge gaps in education, especially at the tertiary level. This era is unique. And as I sat down and I was listening to all that was happening in the space of AI, I thought that what a blessing to be part of what is evolving and the trajectory of education. Whilst being a unique opportunity that is afforded to us by history, we should embrace this as visionary and as resolute as possible in spearheading the change that we see futuristically. Digi or digitization has come to stay. What is important for us is to be original in the creativity and flexibility that it affords to us. And for all of you students who are here and can hear me at the sound of my voice, it's important that while these opportunities are there and you embrace them, you maintain originality and ensure that there is merit in what you do. It is important because in the end, if you are not original, it will show. Through this conference, we have appreciated the fact that every discipline has the potential to embrace and use e-learning technologies. And as the saying goes, where there is a will, there is a way. KNUST management is ready to provide every leadership support, and we have demonstrated this, every leadership support and faculty training required to realize the full potential that this e-learning space affords us. We are committed as a university to providing accessibility, inclusivity, quality, and of course, sustainability in tertiary education, which we have been the main sub-themes as far as this conference is concerned. We believe that our efforts today will go a very long way in supporting government's digitization agenda, which seeks to enhance infrastructure, aid internet connectivity across schools, provide community ICT centers across the country, train the girl child in basic coding, and to also make them accessible to the use of ICT. I hope representatives of the various institutions herein gathered will ensure that the ideals that we chart will be continued. Ultimately, we hope to contribute our quota to the global agenda by providing education without borders and by repositioning ourselves as a university to unlearn the old things and to embrace the new technologies and opportunities in our quest to find solutions to the new ways of doing business and tackling the problems that bedevil us. I am told that cumulatively, the online participation yielded a total number of over 1,200 participants alongside about 250 in-person attendees. This is a remarkable feat, and I want you to applaud yourselves. It gives us a sense of excitement with which people embrace our call for us to come together to learn at this conference. We at KNUSC are so excited to be leading the debate for the adoption of e-learning technologies to remove all the borders to education. But of course, it is not only a right, but it's also the responsibility that goes with it. And this is why it's important that we embrace the responsibility that 
this opportunity generates. As we come to the end of this momentous occasion of this Made in eLearning Ghana conference, I would like to take this moment to reflect on the incredible progress we have witnessed and to express my sincere appreciation to all of you who have made this event possible. First, Dale, my appreciation, deepest appreciation goes to you. Um, at the Center of uh, Digital Innovations at the Arizona State University, and for your presence here in ensuring that the ideals and the cherished memories that we are, we are all creating together are upheld. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, second, I would like to acknowledge the Honorable uh, Minister for uh, Communication and Digitization, Mrs. Esla Ousu Ekufu, the MP, uh, for her role in setting the stage and reminding us of the role that the government is playing in all of this digitization agenda. Next, I would like to recognize Mr. Jemfi Ejabuo. Is it Ejabuo or Ejabuo? Ejabuo, is it? Okay, Ejabuo, because yesterday I read Ejabuo and today is Ejabuo. I hope that somewhere in between Ejabuo and Ejabuo, your name <laughs> lies. So, so, so the, the, the um, confidence interval will be somewhere in the middle. I, I mean, your, your name will be somewhere between Ebiabo and Ebiabo. Okay. So, so Director of St. Louis, uh, I really want to appreciate your presence. And of course, Professor Zeno Wicks, whom I met the other day. Zeno, thank you so very much for participating in this conference. Thank you. i also like to recognize all of you panelists, moderators who have graced this conference with your expertise and insights. I listened keenly in the last session and I was thrilled. It only gives me a flavor of what the rest of you have enjoyed in the last two days. Your contributions have enriched our understanding of e-learning and its potential to transform education in this world. I would also like to express my appreciation to the organizing committee for their tireless efforts in putting together, as I indicated earlier, Thank you so very much. Your dedication and meticulous planning have ensured that this event has been a resounding success. Next, let me just thank all the sponsors. Bell Aqua, Multinec Enterprise, Asib Limited, Aqua Fields, Construction Limited, and the collaborators, all of you, Mastercard Foundation, the Ministry of Education, Ghana, Arizona State University, Association of Commonwealth University, Steady X, and Israel Embassy based in Ghana. Colleagues, I want to assure you, and particularly to you, Dale Johnson, I'd like to promise you and the rest of the, of the team that we will continue to work hard to maintain our enviable position as a global brand, as the number one, as far as quality education is concerned. And I can already sound a gossip that as chair of the ranking committee, I can tell you that there's more good news coming. Oh, yeah. There's more good news coming. We, wa we want you to finish digesting what is on the table first. There's a lot coming. So I can tell you that for free. I want to assure you that we will maintain our enviable position as the best university in the world in terms of quality education. And certainly this is by the Times Higher Education Impact Room ranking. I want to wish all of you well, those of you who have come from far and near. We pray for God's travel mercies and journey mercies to all of you. Travel safe, be safe, keep the burning, uh, keep the flames of e-learning burning and ensure that together we don't stop the discussion but we ensure that the opportunities that accrue to us as far as this space is concerned are fully utilized. I thank you so very much. Thank you. Isn't that beautiful? It is. Please, let's do it again for us. You know, we did an exercise some minutes ago, and that was a preparatory exercise. I, was, I wanted to try and see how many of you can learn how to use the scanning, the Google form, and everything. And I'm told almost everybody was able to scan and scan well. So now is the real exercise. The real exercise for 
the evaluation. I wanted to be sure everybody could do it. So just scan it again and then go back and evaluate. Because you have heard the AI and you have heard all these things, so it affects your evaluation. And so just quickly <laughs> check it. Of course, you won't do an evaluation without ending. You all passed my assignment. Clap for yourself for being good students. And pick up your phone and then evaluate it once more for me. Now, I know you know how to do it. I don't have to struggle. Just a quick one and see. You are good students. Clap for yourselves again. So you have done well. So please clap for yourself and, and evaluate for me. And then we'll be rounding up very soon. Just two minutes. Go there and evaluate for me. Just, just a quick one. Tell your neighbor who is not taking a phone that take your phone. He's watching you. And evaluate for us. It's, 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 it's so that we can improve. So that we can improve. Once you are done, you tell me you are done and we'll move on. So please, for the sake of those who are traveling, evaluate first so that we can finish. So after we close, a, a few couple of announcements that we have. After we close, we'll take lunch and then you can go. However, we have made arrangements for those who do not know KNUS, especially the e-learning center. We'll be taking you on a tour to the e-learning center. I'm sure the master class people, you have already experienced it, but the others who are joining us from elsewhere, you want to have an experience of our e-learning center, what we can do for you, the publishing people, you will not be out of business. Um, you, you, you still have business. All those, there's a bus there. When we close, you just sit in the bus. It will take you around and bring you back to this same location. We want you to have a, a look of it. Take a picture. Tell people of care about what KNUST is doing. And then when you, when, how do they call it? You, the tag. You do a hashtag, KNUST e-learning center. And then, if, if you are mindful, you can add the number one for us. We, we, are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we know we are number one, so we would always be number one. Anyway, so once again, I want to thank our sponsors, Bell Aqua. Bell Aqua for being with us. Martinek Enterprise, Asib Limited, and Aquafields Construction Limited. We know that next year, e-learning Ghana conference Bell Aqua is giving us water, and it, it, they might add drinks and all those things. So Bell Aqua, we have celebrated. We will try your drinks. We will enjoy your drinks. And we know that I've told the finance people to write your name, they, and you increase the number of bottles you give us. So please clap for him, even as he does that for us. And Martinek, too, we appreciate you so much, and Asi Limited, we appreciate you. So, so, so very much. I, are we done? Who has, is not yet done with the evaluation? Okay, who is done? Let me start from here. I need everybody to, wow. So here, please tell the person, if it's not done, we are not moving. So, uh, I'm being a dictator, forgive me. Yeah. This side, Presido, you are done, okay. Next, next year, bring your members, register them and block, all the regional blocks, okay, and come. Then this side, please. Everybody is done. This side, you are done. Okay, so just before we, we, we take the vote of thanks and close, we have some presentations to do. And, and just three presentations that we will do here. The first presentation, okay. the first presentation is to Mr. Jemfi Nkroma Ejabo. So the Executive Director, Center for National Distance Learning and Open Schooling, Sandilos, of the Ministry of Education, Ghana. If, if it's around, if it's not around, maybe I would invite the Director of UITS and then um, Director of e-learning center to jointly present this award to 
um, who is receiving it on his behalf? He's not around, but um, publishing, publishing. Oh, publishing. Please let's clap for him. He's a, he has been our, our best student over the conference. So please, you can take it here so that they take it. Oh, you can take the okay. 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 Thank you for taking the... Please remember, it's for Mr. Tempe. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. The next presentation um, is to the Honorable Minister for Communication and Digitalization. And in order not to... Well, we need a, a lady presenter. And I look to my left, my nursing sister will come and take it on behalf. Oh, okay. The Sandilos, um, it is around. So your, your gift has been taken, but we will give it. <laughs> so you take the minister's own for. Oh, no, you, you receive the minister for communication zone. <laughs> oh, so he, he took your... your <laughs> So then I'm sure he would. The, gender, okay, gender, please. And then. Oh, please, my photo people said upstairs, there's, the stage is better. So please, kindly. Oh, she's coming to represent Esla for us, the minister. <laughs> Okay, so we'll, we'll ask um, the St. Louis director to present to the minister on our behalf. So please, oh, you, you, you can. So please upstage for us so that they can take the shots. Okay, you present and let him. Because he's from the ministry and you are. Then we have balanced it, right? Yes, yes, we have balanced it. Yes. Is it balanced? Balanced. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, the last award, I would, um, with your permission, Provisi, um, Provisi will do us this presentation. And then, like we do in our culture, where we have a, um, a, a visitor visiting at Prof, please, you can be upstage for us. From the university community. So I'll invite our guest speaker, the ambassador for e-learning KNUS to the world. <laughs> 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 So please go, clap for him, clap for Microphone, yes. Hello. Thank you so very much. So this is uh, e-learning Ghana Conference 2023 made in edition. This is a plaque in recognition of Mr. Dale Patrick. I didn't realize the P was Patrick. <laughs> Mr. Dale Patrick Johnson. In grateful appreciation of your exceptional contribution 
as keynote speaker at the Mading e-learning Ghana conference. Your passion, your expertise, and captivating delivery have left an indelible mark on the e-learning landscape here in Ghana. Aiko, well done, well done. You are a true worthy ambassador of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. I, I address him as Your Excellency because he's an ambassador to Kia University. This is for you. Oh, of course, and this is our tradition from the Vice Chancellor. That's, that's the stool that you saw. The golden stool? Yep. Well, this is not exactly the golden stool. <laughs> This is somewhat like a golden stool, but, but definitely not. Um, but the stool is a symbol that, that says that you're welcome to this KNUSC anytime. In fact, you are welcome to Asantimang anytime. You. And you're welcome to this country anytime. This is our way of saying we're giving you a seat, a permanent seat here in this country. And of course, the statuette of the, uh, no, this is the first prime minister, I mean the president of this country, His Excellency, late Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. So thank you so very much. This is in recognition of your excellent participation. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dale. Thank you so very much. Oh, there's more. Oh, wow, wow. This one is for the wife, let me, I, this, for I, releasing him to I, us. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very typical Ghanaian. If your wife were to be I'm sure that she would have uh, uh, worn this alongside you. But this is a very beautiful kente piece uh, for, your, for your wife. And um, of course, uh, she can decide what to use this for. Um, I once saw one of our friends using hers for, for a tablecloth. <laughs> <laughs> but it's up to her. Typically here, they'll use it for, for a, a slate and cover and all of this. Right. And then, of course, there's a mark for you. The uh, university wishes you well in your drinking, whether it's coffee or tea. I wish you so well. And safe travels when you do travel. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, do it again for them. So we just want to also acknowledge some, you know, this conference is blessed in terms of top manage, managers of universities that were with us. We have the principal of Wesley Training College now. He was with us. If it's still around, can we see him and acknowledge him, the principal? Okay. And then one of the freshest university. In, in, in town, and in the east, they say, from a, 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 a town called Somenya, the registrar of that university, it's here. And we want to acknowledge her. Madam, please be upstanding and let the audience recognize you. <laughs> university of Environment and sustainable development. And because of the sustainability, next year she will be here for sustainability sake. Please clap for her once again. <laughs> By that, she will register how many people next year for bring your staff on the spot. Okay, we'll talk about it, right? Okay. And then all the team that you came with, please be upstanding and let's specially recognize you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I would invite Madam Fyodora Odro to give the vote of thanks and we'll be out of here. Thank you, Chris and everybody. So um, representing the planning committee for this maiden edition of uh, e-learning conference Ghana and of course global we want to first of all express our sincere appreciation to our Lord God Almighty for this beautiful two-day session. Uh, all those who travel far and near to be here, traveling messes by God's grace. So we are saying thank you, Jesus, for 
this successful program. Secondly, I want to really thank uh, Madam Vice Chancellor. I was really expecting her to be here, but wherever she is, I know she's online with us. Madam Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, Registrar Management, I want to say thank you for supporting us. Yesterday, we saw almost all the provosts here, and it, that was very, very encouraging. We want to say, God, God bless you. We want to say we are grateful. Of course, ProVC has done a lot of my part for me already. The Minister uh, for Communication and Digitalization, thank you for connecting um, digitally to speak to us. We are so grateful. And uh, of course, Dale and our keynote speakers, we can't say thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. To, to speak to us and also to teach us uh, so many things about e-learning. To all our conference speakers and presenters, to be frank, this conference would have come on if you have not registered to present, right? So to our conference speakers, those who did poster presentation, those who did in-person presentation, all of you, God bless you for your presentation. You want to say keep researching. The Pandora box has been opened. The way has been opened for all of us to go ahead to keep researching. So thank you so much to the leadership of e-learning and all Professor Erica Parsante and all the lieutenants. Thank you for the vision. Thank you for this maiden edition. May not be the end. Let's keep dreaming big. Thank you for supporting the vision of our vice chancellor to digitize the things that we do in KNUST. We want to say God bless you. We want to say a very big thank you to Director of UITS. Director, thank you and all your team for the support. Azu and all the champions from UITS. We love you. You were fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us here. To our MCs, our moderators, our reporters, the media team, my IT guys, the back room, the front room, the side room, wherever you are hiding. We want to say Aiko, God bless you so much for making this really a digitized conference, right? Less paperwork, more phones, and uh, even with those who are using the super young phone, we're able to uh, connect it, not only the iPhone people. That's a fantastic, that's one. I want to say God richly bless you. As sponsors, see, Frank was very happy when I got to know that uh, people came in to sponsor us. Thank you so, so, so much. Uh, we can't say thank you enough to Mastercard Foundation, to Sid Arizona, and everybody coming in to us. Of course, the planning committee, Pro Vice Chancellor has thank you. But I want to say a sincere thanks to all the subcommittee members who did the legwork who were running about our cleaners, our ashes, our drivers, those who carry the chairs, the tables, everybody who cleaned their room, who threw out the garbage, everybody who played one role or the other. I can't say thank you enough to the kitchen team. Yeah, they fed us. So I want to say so much, God bless you to everybody who has helped this conference to be a success. I know the planning committee, you are not going to close now, though we are closing. I are going to be here to make sure that we put the whole place in order. And of course, to all of you who travel far and near, we want to say a very big God bless you for coming to grace the occasion for us. We are praying for traveling mercies. May the Lord take you safely. Carry the message of KNUST everywhere you go. And know that a year by this time, should God give us the grace to come once again for this conference, we'll be here in our numbers. Thank you for coming. God bless us all. God bless you too. If I, um, I was nearly beating small, but I think I, I can go back to that one. Um, there was um, a senior secondary school that joined us throughout the conference, and we need to acknowledge them. And, and, and the Infancy Film School Squad, please be upstanding for us to, to acknowledge the, the, them. But they were the only school to come. Please clap for them again. Thank you. Then the sign language, those who are doing this, sometimes I wonder how they do it. So please clap, clap, clap for them too. 
So after the closing prayer, we'll take some pictures. And this is the order of the uh, picture taking. The dignitaries will be upstage. All of us will be down to make it nice. We all can fit here. And then when they, they leave, we'll take, you can, the banner is for you. You can take self, you tag yourself, KNUST, KNUST. Even if you dream, let KNUST appear. Amen. <laughs> so please, let's be upstanding as we take the closing prayer. So we want a student to bless us before we leave. Any student, student-centered. So there's a volunteer there. Hello. Oh, wow, my students can pray. It's two Please people. Please let's pray. OK, gender balance. Father, we thank you for such a wonderful meeting. We thank you for bringing us together from far and near and imbibing your knowledge in us. We pray for your grace and your sustenance that wherever we go, you lead us and help us to make more than enough impact. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you was church, I'll ask you, ask the name of the person sitting next to you. You don't have to go without making so. <laughs> so please, we take the photograph there first. Come, don't leave. Come here yeah, and let's take that, please. Taco, okay. My CJ, is to please come up stage. Not knowing he knows what's best for you at the exact time. Don't categorize things into bad or good. Because as far as you know, the universe is conspiring to help us all the way through. When something undesirable happens to us, it's natural of humans to complain about it. But God is a master strategist. Hello, please make I may not oh, see no. it, but still I'm trusting. God is working, He is working, He is working. Tell you, God is working, working, working. Your business with God is working. Tell you, everybody. Take the last one. It's lunch time. Don't forget your lunch. My God, it's lunch time as well. Thank you.